Hey guys. Part 3 of what if Naruto became the Hokage before the 5 Kage summit. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 7, Darkest Emotion If there was one word to describe Danzo, then it was devious. The man was shrewd and ruthless. He has a distinct fanaticism to Kanoha's military might, being the most powerful throughout the elemental countries as proven during the First Shinobi World War. Why wouldn't it be? The village hidden in the leaves was established by the two most powerful clans before the formation of what was to be called now as Fire Country. This along with the bountiful resources that Fire Country had in agriculture, fishery and the like, had established the nation as a powerful force to be reckoned with. Danzo wanted to maintain that power and saw that the teachings of the Sandame as too lenient and diplomatic. To him, there was no way to solve conflict without proper military intervention. He had seen war, he had been a part of it, he knew that killing was a necessary evil, and he would willingly do so again if it meant Kanoha would remain at the top. It was worthy to note that the teachings of the Sandame were stemmed from Hashirama and Toborama of the Senju, the Shodame and Nidame respectively, and that those that followed after Haruzen were also followers of their ideals. From Minato to Naruto, these leaders of Kanoha had been slash R, without a doubt, shining examples of their time. Due to the images and personalities gained from each of these three leaders, the villagers and ninja alike grew to follow them in a heartbeat. Minato, after the Third Shinobi War, had been graced as Kanoha's finest. Nothing or no one could have been compared to the Fourth Hokage. He was a prime and excellent example of what a shinobi should be. That was why the people loved him, why they followed him to an extent that bordered to fanaticism. But even with the Yandame, Danzo could not be convinced of this. Danzo saw the Yandame as a fool who followed the teachings of his rival, he views the Yandame as a weak-hearted fool that could not capitalize on the sanctions given to Earth Country and possibly rid themselves of a nuisance for good after the Third War. That was why he was denied of the position to succeed the seed after him, and stating Danzo as Hokage meant going to war just after the Yandame had sealed the Kyubi into his own son. Shikaka had wondered what had occurred to Danzo's mind why he wanted to take matters this early on. Why couldn't he have taken the seat in a matter of five days that the Rokadame was away? It might have been that the old war hawk had started his planning from there. He wasn't sure how the other countries would react to this, but he would be sure that it would put Kanoha on a bad side if Danzo would succeed. Which he doubts it, an assault on a Kaiga in the presence of five Kaigas no less would be quite idiotic. Danzo should have known that. Or is it that the man had finally grown impatient after years of tolerance under the rule of the Sandame and the Godame? Shikaku would never know, nor would he care to ever find out. To him, Danzo was a criminal now, there was nothing more to be said about the man that had been plotting in the shadows. Shikaku sat on the tallest building that Yamato had created, intent of observing the skirmishes that are about to take place, he could see Yamato on a fair distance by the northern gate as he stopped, along with him were Naruto's former classmates. Yamato then began to weave his hands to a series of seals at a fast rate. He said to the chunin that were with him, Do any of you trust me? All of them nodded. Yamato merely gave a smirk. Then don't move for a second, Kiba-san, Lee-san and Tenten-san. You three will serve as the strike force. I'll provide the distraction. Yamato had then ended his slew of seals and shouted, Mokutan, Dejirin no Jutsu. Wood release, great forest technique. Pillars of wood rose on the ground, propelling Kiba, Lee and Tenten straight up. All three of them look at each other as the rest of the pillars began interweaving with one another upwards, with some of them now bending and began barraging the northern gate below. The root operatives immediately went out of formation as the pillars began bombarding them at an astronomical rate. Down below, Yamato was panting. The things I do for my village. The ANBU captain muttered taking a deep breath and then nodded to the remaining members of Naruto's friends. Chuji-san, I want you to use your Baika no Jutsu, multi-size technique, and serve as artillery while the others get to their work. Shino-san, I want you and Ino-san to serve as backup and you are to engage when you feel the need to, 
especially Inosan since she is our medic in this field. Under any circumstance, don't intercept the ninja unless they are blindsided. As the barrage of the wooden pillars came to a screeching halt, the five root members regrouped and began scaling the bent wooden poles like a ramp. Each member was dashing on their own pillars as the three churning up at the summit of this wooden square structure began to prepare. Now let us burn with our flames of youth and drive these people out who threaten the fire of our village. Lee shouted raising his right hand to his side. Kiba smirked riding his ever loyal companion, Akamaru. Well boy, looks like we're going to have to party. To the Inazuka's right was Tenten who rolled her eyes. It was so typical of men. Grabbing a small scroll, she unsealed the content inside to reveal a kuzurigama and another scroll that contained a nodachi. Whatever, stop dawdling and let's get this over with. Tenten jumped as she landed on one of the pillars with Kiba jumping as he shouted Yahoo. His dog barked in agreeing as the duo jumped below. This time, Kiba was running with Akamaru, both at the same speed. Lee followed suit as he too jumped and somersaulted, landing on the wooden ramp down slope the pull of gravity accelerating their speeds. They could feel their adrenaline pumping, as their hearts raced as they dashed downwards with the pull of the Earth's gravity below. They could feel as if they were free-falling at such speeds with the wind gushing to their faces. One of the root members in the middle clasped his hands together and formed a seal. Ninpo Enmaku, Ninja Art Smokescreen Out of the sleeve of the one in the middle, as his area was soon covered with smoke, Takiba, it didn't matter, you can't get away. Giji Ninpo, Shikyaka no Jutsu. Beast Mimicry Ninja Art, for legs technique. As soon as he applied the Jutsu, Kiba and Akamaru dashed even faster, as the boy squatted to Akamaru's level and dashed on his limbs, making fair scratch marks on his side of the column. Two members then jumped from the smoke, wearing identical masks just like the one who initiated the smoke screen. Kiba could smell the scent in both of them as they lunged at him from above. Kiba then spun like a drill as did Akamaru to avoid getting assaulted by the two elite members. Gutsuga. Twin Piercing Fong. The two clones prevented their attacks altogether as Kiba stopped to a screeching halt as another member had appeared from underneath the wood this time, popping from the said structure and almost sliced Kiba's head off, who had ducked just in time. It was then that a gigantic Chuji had appeared behind Kiba who then gathered chakra at the palm of his hands and throttled his hands on the area where Kiba was, Chuharite. Mega palm thrust, the piece in front of Kiba shattered plummeting the ANB with the cat mask down to the ground. Kiba looked back and both he and Akamaru regrouped seeing as the ANB earlier with the shadow clones lunged at him once again, Shigetsu. Rising Moon The clones of the root operative swiped at Kiba with their swords sideways from the center. Kiba ducked and immediately stopped when he saw the cat mask the NBU appeared below, about to give a rising vertical slash. Kiba rolled to his side and noticed Akamaru's scent at the top of the clones. The fang boy then recovered his footing as he dashed straight upwards with his four limbs. Kiba then appeared this time with Akamaru once again on top, as both master and familiar began spinning like drills again and both began to intertwine this time. Tensuga. Heaven Twin Fang. The two formed a large drill-like attack easily rivaling as that of the Garuga, Twin Wolf Fong, as the two ran towards the three shadow clones, dispelling the two clones and with the drill. The gigantic drill then drove the ANBU to the ground in a loud and sickening thud as the attack almost began digging deeper into the hole that the two had created. With Lee As soon as the three of them dashed down, Lee had already prepared to loosen his bandages and had discarded his leg weights. He threw them to the root member that was on his pillar. The man dodged and saw the things fall down as it picked up quite a pile of dust below, and even gave a small crater to the ground. The ANB quickly turned his head around and Lee was already giving a straight flying kick at him. Lee's dynamic entry was parried however by the man's elbow arm padding. Lee jumped and used a somersault back landing on the wood column. The man idly carefully underneath his lizard mask. The man seemed unmoving at first until his hand flickered together. Lee wasted no time as the man finished his jutsu and unfurled a gakaku no jutsu straight at him. Lee jumped and evaded the fireball. As went past him, the elite root member came upon him with daggers burning from his hand. Lee then kicked the man's forearms to avoid getting incinerated by those things and controlled his trajectory landing just in front of the man. 
The root member he was facing was a Katon expert, and not just any Katon expert. It seemed that the man can use Katon at a close range effective enough to be weapon. His chakra was converted to flames as he held on to his dagger. Katon, Sukoenga, fire release, twin tiger blaze fong. However, once Chuji had started to shake things up with his Chuharite, Lee saw the man distracted for a moment. Quick to capitalize, Lee sped up, and in a blink of an eye, the gap between him and the man was cut short. Lee then gave a straight jab at the man's chest that had flinched from the pain. The man staggered but regained his footing, spinning around with his daggers in his hands. The flames arced in a wide angle almost grazing Lee at the cheek and at his flak jacket. Lee inwardly cursed the burning pain that he felt from his abdomen and cheek. The man then stopped, spun the dagger in his left hand in a reverse grip, and then he gave forward thrust of his dagger straight at Lee who elbowed the man's left elbow drove a knee on the man's gut. The man staggered back as Lee had jumped once again and spun around. Kanoha Senpu Lee forewind The man blocked with his forearm, but Lee did a reversal once his kick was parried. He used the halting force of the block and then reversed his spin, going for a low sweep kick that forced the man to fall Lee wasn't done yet. And he held the man by the elbow and disarmed his and spun around doing the same to his left before delivering a straight kick to the chest. Lee jumped down loosening his bandages even further plummeting down below as he went after the man, his bandages coming loose. Hashiman Tanku, Dekiman, Kaiman, Kai. Eight gates opening, first gate, limit gate open. He felt the limiters in his muscles and chakra break away as the bandages unfurled and began to wrap on the Katan user whose weapons were clearly off from his hand. Lee had managed to reach the person and then began hold the man by the waist as the ANBU member was wrapped by the bandages like a cocoon. Lee then began to spin around like a top, spinning faster and faster until they looked like a miniature tornado. Wind currents were picked up fast as Lee drove the man below to the ground. Omote wrench. Primary Lotus. Boom! With Ten Ten. Ten Ten threw her Kuzurigama at the root member with his sword drawn out. The member deflected the sickle with ease. Ten Ten pulled back the chain of the Kuzurigama, and the man still dodged. The man then accelerated his pace, going directly to Ten Ten at such short notice. His sword brandished to his front as the sun glistened and shone its light to Ten Ten, casting her into his illusion. Megan, Shiranui, demonic illusion, phosphorescent light. In that moment, Tenten saw what appeared to be a dancing ball of light as the image of the man contorted into a wavy pattern, going around her vision as he toyed with her senses. Tenten was never really good at genjutsu. In fact, she wasn't very talented in that field on her own as she, as Guy had trained her, was a long-range expert who had improved on weapons training since invasion of the sand and sound. Besides, to her field, Genjutsu would likely cause more problems in her weapons training. She was trained to adapt to every single weapon she could think of, and that meant her studies in each field continued to be met with training for hours on end. From swords, axes to spears, it was too much already to do more than that. Ten Ten, with her nodachi in her right hand, blocked the white light that seemed to flicker and dance in her eyes. As she heard the high-pitched sound of metal clashing against metal, she felt a sudden, painful pushing force pushing her at her back. She felt her feet lost the object she was supposed to stand on. She saw her vision as blurry. The sounds she heard were only ringing as if it was a high-pitched tune that was about to destroy her eardrums, as the ringing continued to vibrate in her ear. The flicks and dances of the wisp, as she named, made its way towards at the top of her head, but her senses, her visions came to a sudden abruption, when one clear sound had broken her out of her reverie. Boom! She could hear a large slamming of force just beneath her. As she was awakened to her senses, she could see the shattering of wood below, and the ANBU Black Ops agent free-falling towards her. As she looked around a descending splinter of the wooden frame that Yamato built, and destroyed by a giant palm from Chuji, descending very close to a wooden platform she could see just to her right. Fixating her descending trajectory, she landed on her feet on the descending pile of wood, and used it as a plank to jump to the platform, she threw the sickle of her kuzurigama at the platform and then swung around the giant symmetrical tree blocks and then with chakra gathered at her feet. Stuck herself on a completely perpendicular piece of wood to the ground. The ninja with the owl mask that had cast the illusion earlier at her, 
chased after her as he jumped and weaved through the wooden blocks. Tenten had let go of her kuzurigama and then grabbed a handful of kunai. All of them had explosive notes tied to their rings. She bit the nodachi on the flat part of her blade as she began to run and jump through the massive coils of symmetrical wood and fired kunai after explosive kunai to the NBU who seemed unfazed by the impact despite the fact that he was freaking close to the to the highly explosive daggers. That didn't seem to stop the operative as a kunai came merely centimeters away from his mask and exploding on his back. The man was clever. He used the impact to boost his speed and gained in closer to the kunoichi. Tenten cursed her luck as she grabbed her nodachi situated between her teeth by the handle as she defended herself from the man. The clashing of blades could be heard below as Tenten and the man clashed swords with one another. She was kicked by the man on her abdomen as she stumbled back, but not before unsealing a small scroll from her hands and hurled it at the man. The scroll unfurled and revealed a stored seal pattern in the middle. Tenten then raised her hand in a half ram seal and unfurled a small globular object that seemed to be glued with numerous kanai. There was a small explosive note in the middle that was about to go off. Another loud explosion was heard and countless shrapnel had exploded as the explosive note went off, triggering the gunpowder in the ball to release the shrapnel from it. In a stifling sensation of pain, the ANBU member felt his footing on the wooden structure fall off, as he could feel his chakra loosing its grip on the wooden structure. As the root member stared upwards, before he completely hit the ground, he saw a giant pole, no, a tetsubo being hurled at him. Tenten had taken cover after that explosion, as she saw the man was caught of guard. A few more seconds and the man could have had her head, as he saw the man descend from the explosion, with a few kunai embedded on his chest and abdomen. Tenten seized the opportunity to finish the fight as she gave a jump that would be considered a leap of faith and unfurled another small scroll unsealing it, and revealed a tetsubo. She held it between her palms and gripped the weapon firmly. She then swung the heavy object with its tip straight at the man as they began to descend. The weapon had hit the root member straight at the chest further plummeting them down. They landed on the ground with a thunderous crash, as the earth below gave small fissures and cracks due to the weight of the weapon, her victim crushed under the weight. She breathed a sigh of relief as she then looked to her sideways. Kiba and Akameru were resting under the shade of the wood, as did Lee as they looked upwards. It felt like something was still missing. To their surprise, another member had quickly appeared at the top, intent on taking down Chuji from the forehead straight down. His sword had glowed blue from his chakra as winds began to pick up. Furtun, Ama no Furyukin, Wind Release, Wind Dragon Sword of Heaven. The chakra began to stretch and form a sharp blade that was about to descend to Chuji. Chuji, surprised by the sudden appearance couldn't very well dodge in time, Tenten, -ten, Li and Kiba watched as their friend was about to be sliced down in the middle, until they had seen the man was suddenly surrounded with swarms of insects. Hijitsu Mushidama, Secret Technique, Insect Sphere I am sorry I am late. My timing was a little off. Shino had suddenly appeared on the summit of the wooden structure, hands in his pockets and his back to the enemy, as swarms of his insects enveloped the man that not even a glimpse of hair could be seen. I have intervened as I had deemed necessary, per Yamato Taishu's instructions. He then brought out his right hand open close to his face, as he said in his monotone voice, You, who threaten the life of our comrade, shall suffer the wrath of my insects by a thousandfold. With that, he balled his right hand into a fist as the man's chakra was consumed to an absolute zero as he descended below to the ground, his insects slowly going back to his sleeves. Chuji dispelled his technique and gave a sigh of relief as he stumbled back. This was the third time he felt that he was going to die. It had been that close when he was about to be severed in half. He was thankful he had someone like Shino on his team. Ino had arrived below the tree, running through each and every one of them checking for injuries. To her right, was Yamato who sat down under the shade of the tree. With that, the initial strike has begun they just needed to wait for the remaining Konoha Shinobi to take care of the remaining root problem. Tsunade's tent. Aoba, Shizen, and Genma were nervous. It had been a few minutes since the battle had begun. And by now, the citizens would have noticed the signs already and went back inside. Ginma and Aoba were outside as Shizen was beside the Godain, attending to her needs. Shizen was nervous, 
the fact that the enemy could strike any moment was making it hard for her to focus. Taunton was at her side, concerned for his caretaker. Shizen had pet her pet pig as she sat down beside her master. She heard the sounds of explosions. Echoing through the skies of Kanoha, she could hear the sounds of footsteps abound as countless of her fellow ninja had begun running around the area, sniffing about of any of Danzo's forces that are about to threaten the Godame. Outside, Ginma held his saban between his teeth like a toothpick. His hands were at his sides not normally within his pockets. He was wary, and he should be. These were elite fighters they were taking on. Yamato's squad had the advantage when Yamato lead them and the fact that they had superior numbers compared to the people of the Northern Gate. He had seen almost every NBU member take off their mask and began searching the area, so as to not confuse anyone further. Root Ninja tend to act like ANBU loyalists, but the difference is that Root Ninja do not respond to any communication unless it involves the mission. To them, there was nothing more important than the task that had been given to them. To his right, he saw Aoba tense as he adjusted his sunglasses. The man was just as wary as Ginma. These are black ops agents. They tend to be absolutely ruthless when given the task. It was what made Root so damn efficient at what they do. But they also had the lowest recruits. Often, the ninjas that are put under Danzo's training program were neglected children who are never going to attend the academy. In here, Danzo and his subordinates would brainwash these children to forget anything that had to do with their past, their lives, their ages, their hobbies, their names, and the list goes on. It was inhuman, Elba thought. These people were trained to become killers with no emotion, not even a tangible sense of guilt. In Aoba's musings, it was then that they saw three ninja about to approach them. Aoba and Ginma visibly tensed as they saw these three with hollowed look on their faces. Ganma's teeth tightened the grip on his saman. Just in time, Shizen had appeared at the entrance of the tent. She had closed the cloth that led to Tsunade's room as she said to the ninja that stood before her, You will not get past this point from this moment on. Shizen then raised her right sleeve revealing a set of saban shooters on her forearms. The weapons glistened in the sun as it accentuated its deadliness in front of the three emotionless ninja before them. Unknown to the six combatants, a silhouette of a boy had squatted down behind Tsunade's tent. A small black rat had appeared inside sniffing around the small room. Iron Country From the team, the samurai who jumped in the midst of the chaos had pushed him to this area, as the wave of swordsmen began cutting down root members left and right that used the woodlands as their shield with the samurai splitting into different directions intent on taking down every last one of the usurpers. Shikamaru got swept by the tide of really aggressive samurai, being pulled the sudden gush of battle when one of them dragged him into this depressing wood area and that was what led to this scenario. Shikamaru stood up straight on a tree branch as he glanced to his side, taking a small peek at a squad of the root shinobi. Grabbing a pair of smoke bombs from his satchel, the lazy strategist looked to his other side and gave a deep breath. Compared to these people, Shikamaru's physical prowess was unappealing. He can't outrun someone like Kiba or Lee, can't outmatch Chuji and Naruto in strength, and can't even strike as fast as Niji. Shikamaru found it troublesome to include any effort in physical training. Instead, he focused on letting his mind do the work, weaving formulaic plans that take a lot of people by surprise. Every time he used such articulate forms of tactics, almost all of his enemies play into his hands every single time. Shikamaru sighed again. His glaring disadvantage had been obvious earlier, and it was only thanks to his teammates that he was able to initiate the Kagen Nui, Shadow Needles, at a closer proximity than he was originally comfortable in. Without something to cast a light around the area, his shadow techniques would be fairly useless. Shikamaru grasped one of the trench knives that once belonged to Asuma, gripping it with his free arm tight. As the three ninjas began to scour the dead frost of a forest, Shikamaru crouched down and began to think. In heavily forested areas and jungle warfare, the best strategy would be to use guerrilla tactics. Striking simple but enough to slow down the opponent for easy pickings at the end, and although Shikamaru had the patience, he didn't have the drive to do such tactics here, and with his shadow techniques out of the question at the moment. It would mean that his only choice to fight these assassins were to use his ningu and trap-making specialties. Fifteen shuriken, five kanai, ten meters of ninja wire, a flash bomb, two smoke bombs, 
and twenty kibaka futa, explosive notes. Yep, restocking is a bitch before an emergency mission. Shikamaru then stood up, for another time he had grabbed another stick of cigar from his former teacher's remaining stock. He popped one on his mouth and with a lighter, he ignited the cancer stick and began to let the nicotine fill his lungs. Now he knew why Asuma was addicted to this, somehow the cigarettes always made his nerves calm down. Smoke bomb still in his hand, the young tactician ran forward, finally deciding to do his strategy. Ambush is out of the question, I'm not stupid enough to do that with my techniques limited, guerrilla tactics it is. Shikamaru then with one of his kanai, wrapped an explosive note by the handle carefully, and began stalking the three root agents that had just went past him and separated to three different areas. Shikamaru, standing at a safe distance, flicked the kunai from his hand with it being thrown into the area that one of the operatives was at. The kunai had hit a trunk of the tree and gave a small resounding thunk, as it embedded itself on the tree. The root member with the ape mask looked at the kunai that had suddenly exploded, sending him careening to the side by the initial shockwave. The operative looked back from where he thought the kanai was fired and soon gave chase. Shikamaru fastened three explosive notes underneath the branch he had stood on then jumped below after throwing the first kanai. As he had hid himself below from of the bushes, he then grabbed four shuriken from his pouch and then changed his position to get a better angle to aim the throwing stars. Once the member had landed on the branch that he had made, Shikamaru propped his hands together for a ram seal and the three explosive notes immediately had set off and ignited causing a resounding boom throughout the forest. The root operative then fell down, emerging from the black smoke caused by the charred remains of the tree above. As the man descended from the freefall, Shikamaru, seeing that the man was now blindsided, flicked the four shuriken from his pouch and threw a kunai. Sure enough, the four shuriken had embedded itself on the man's limbs with the kunai sailing through the man's throat. Shikamaru thought he had a lucky shot at that. He expected someone like Tenten to do that kind of difficult shot. But then again, he wasn't too shabby on his ningi usage, or so he thought. Shikamaru immediately leapt away from the scene before those two members managed to jump him at the moment. Shikamaru's features darkened, flicking a smoke bomb in the area to bide him more time on how to attack the remaining two members currently on his tail. One down. Smoke had littered the area to where the two operatives arrived. Seeing the fallen form of their comrade, they checked on the dead man and looked everywhere. The windpipe has been pierced, based from position that he had fallen and the angle of the kanai, the enemy has taken a southwest route. With that, the two ninja had flickered out of sight. Over to the more forested area, Shikamaru then whisked his plan into motion. Now that the one of them was out of the fight, this would be a whole lot easier than he had thought and if worse comes to worse, then a little gamble with the flash bomb would be his last resort. As soon as he began weaving trap after trap with his ninja wire and fifteen explosive notes around a small area, Shikamaru then grabbed one of the three remaining kunai in his pouch and planted one on top of the canopy of branches above. It was a good thing there was no light source for once, if there was then the shadow of that kunai could have been utterly obvious. As he finished attaching the wires to the kunai on top, Letting the tension of the wire reach its peak, Shikamaru then jumped away. He had two kunai and eleven shuriken left, coupled with a flash bomb that was all the tools he had left, and still no jutsu was used. Shikamaru's never-ending patience was seemingly running thin. For him to be in this kind of disadvantage, it was terribly frustrating and difficult. Shikamaru then turned to a corner, marking one of the trees with a slash from his kunai. Shikamaru knew that these people would be treating this mark as a decoy, and that was the pineapple-headed Chunin had wanted them to think. Naruto is going to owe him for this later, big time. As soon as he had let his traps set into motion, he made it a point to let himself get in the way of the root agents, for the first time. Finally making his tracks obvious, Shikamaru leaned forward a little and soon ran like the devil itself was chasing after him. When the operatives had finally managed to obtain the rail tracks left behind by the Chunin, they soon ran at full speed following the trail left behind by the Nara. Once they had caught up to Shikamaru, Shikamaru threw four shuriken that were easily deflected by the two masked ninja. Shikamaru then pulled out his remaining smoke bomb and tossed it on the ground. The smoke screen littered the area in a blanket of gray smog that the two agents got into. 
Shikamura had then jumped from the smoke and immediately let loose eight shuriken from his hands and heard the sounds of multiple tensioned wires being effectively cut, springing the wires and lashed towards the blanket of smog like whips as it waved in the air and bound the operatives like the slithering body of a viper. Once the smoke had cleared, Shikamura could see only one person in the binding tap that he made. Shit! Shikamura then turned around and saw that the ANBU was already on top of him, with his sword brandished upwards. Shikamura had two kunai left in his pouch, and he tossed it at the man before jumping back and unfurling three more shuriken and throwing it at the remaining mobile root member. Shikamura cursed his luck, he had no more ningu at his disposal. His jutsu were too close range for him to do the next step and the man that was bound by his trap was about to get out. Shikamaru then raised his right hand and formed a half ram seal. The member then looked down as the explosive notes gave of a hissing sound as the sparks and flames began eating away at the paper. As each of the explosive notes ate itself whole, a resounding explosion could be heard in the dense woodlands of Iron Country, wiping out a single man, now only charred remains, as a small crater bore itself as a testament to the fifteen explosive notes that had went off at the same time. Through this small distraction, Shikamura capitalized the moment and held out Asuma's trench knives and then threw them to the man who jumped away. Not one to finish his last gamble, Shikamura then tossed his only tool left to his back. A flash bomb. With it making contact on a small tree, the bomb went off and gave such a blinding white light that the remaining operative in Shikamaru's sight shielded his eyes. Shikamaru, in that very second, had finally began molding his chakra and activated his kagenui. The branches of the shadow needles crawled through the trench knives and instantly expanded, as it rose upwards and ascended like blades of grass and descended on the blinded man, finally impaling him on every conceivable part of his body. The man fell down in Olympus. Shikamaru gave a sigh of relief. The tacticians slumped on the forest and gazed up, how he wished that things were simpler back then when they were kids. Shikamaru didn't care anymore. He just wanted to take it easy for a moment, while staring lazily towards the dull and gray clouds that blanketed the skies of Iron Country. Shikamaru then let out another cigarette from Asuma's last pack and lit the said nicotine stick. I can see why Asuma-sensei was addicted to this stuff. Another puff of the said stick and Shikamaru rested his head comfortably on the bark of the tree. He'd get back to his team later, right now. He wanted to recover his mind from doing those things so much. He'll be back. Eventually. Hinata. The moment the gates were opened, and the moment that the men had begun their assault, Hinata had activated her Byakugan to see just where her teammates were. When the samurai had literally bulldozed their way towards the positions of the ANBU members, her vision shifted when she saw the collapse of the giant earth wall that was severed on its lower part, resulting in the collapse of said wall and burying some of the ninjas there. Her vision, however, shifted again when she heard Kakashi questioning her about Naruto's chakra coils, which, surprisingly enough, were intermingling with each other, and that Naruto had three types of chakra flowing in him. The myriad of blue, green and red entered her vision, looking at the center of Naruto's chakra reserves. She could see that the green energy and the red one were trying to cancel each other out. In the middle laid the blue, normal chakra that was trying to absorb both. When the red one somewhat stabilized, the green energy began to feed the blue more of its energy as it then began to mix. It had looked like Sage Mode had the ability to neutralize some negative effects that the red chakra had. The malevolent red energy was being put on stasis, slowly being absorbed by the blue energy. Her musings were cut off when she had seen to her back was an ANBU member that was poised to strike her down until a blast of wind had sent the man flying from her and hitting the cold hard ground, skidding to the snow by the attack. Hack Kushu, 8 trigrams, wind palm. Please do not let your guard down, Hinata-sama. Niji quickly implied as he chased after the root ANBU reeling back his hand giving a palm strike directly at the chest. Hinata nodded and turned around her sights focused on the person in front of her, it was another operative. Byakugan still active, Hinata had lowered her stance to the Jukin, palms open and faced against her would-be assailant, charging palms open. The root ANBU jumped overhead just as Hinata had outstretched her palm, sailing past over the man that had used a somersault over her, the operative then raised his sword, about to slash Hinata in a vertical swipe. 
The girl fluidly dodged to her right and directed her palm to the ANBU member's back. The operative twisted his body as he landed down, carefully evading the attack by mere centimeters from his spine. The man then landed on his free left hand and was about to swipe his sword horizontally at Hinata's thighs, but the girl managed to jump back evading the attack that could have crippled her for life. Maintaining her stance in the Jukin, Hinata watched her opponent carefully. Studying the man carefully before making another assault, Hinata focused her vision to his chakra system that was now flowing like a cascading waterfall. Niji Nizan has more experience in fighting armed shinobi than I am. Tenten San had been his sparring partner for a long time. I've been more used to fighting enemies unarmed. This would be difficult. But Niji Nizan always said that sword users are predictable to where and how they swing. If it's above their head, they will do a vertical cut. If it's by the waist or torso with the hilt forward, it's a horizontal slash, and if the blade is pointing forward. The man then poised ran towards Hinata, his body flickering from side to side, the tip of the blade as expected, was pointed towards her. A thrust. Hinata simply leaned her torso to her left, effectively dodging the blade. Hinata then with her right arm, grabbed the man by the wrist with her two fingers, tried to poke the man's tenketsu situated on his solar plexus. The man blocked with his free arm, using his white arm as a shield. Hinata then adjusted her strike and instead of poking the man by the chest, she directed her finger to close the tenketsu on the man's right arm. Somehow, Hinata could hear a silent grunt of pain coming from the operative as he felt the grip on his sword loosen. Hinata then felt the man force his sword down. Hinata then stepped forward and ducked. The blade completely missing her by a few inches as she went past the hilt. Hinata countered with another palm strike, this time, to the nape of his neck, trying to destroy the man's peripheral nervous system. The man simply ran forward, with Hinata missing her strike. The man grunted in pain as he tried to lift his right arm but couldn't do so. There was that tingling, numbing pain that he had felt. But pain was a mere obstacle. Root had taught him that. Pain blocks what the mind wants. Survival instincts are non-essential to ninjas of Root, to them. They had been trained to ignore their flight response as normal humans. Fighting would be their only option, if anything, if it meant cutting your own arm off to succeed in the mission then do so. By all means, you exist for the mission, nothing else. The member could not feel his right arm. The prickling sensation sent to his right arm was all there is. It looked somehow limp. But the man still held on to his sword tighter, as if his own will had strengthened in holding his katana. Forcing his hand up, the member didn't flinch, or once wince with the amount of pain delivered to his right arm. All he knew was that he needed to win. The drive in his mind to finish and succeed in the mission was all that he needed. Nothing more. It was the belief that his superior had instilled in his mind for as long as he was active. In root you do not exist. You have no past. You have no present. You have no future. Only the mission. Hinata watched intently as the man forced his right arm to chest level, forcing chakra on the closed tenketsu point that she had just blocked. She could see how the man was forcefully opening the small blocked point. She found herself cringe at the amount of pain that it must be doing to him. Forcefully opening your tenketsu point would lead to a serious amount of injury, one of which was straining the chakra coils that streamed the energy all around the body. A forceful opening could lead to the collapse or burst of the veins that travel the chakra to different parts of the body. The man used a ram seal as he began molding chakra and then held his sword in a reverse grip. Ninpo, Mikidzuki no Mai, Ninja Art, Dance of the Crescent Moon. The man then separated to two, as the two clones began hovering to her side, as it looked like a firefly dancing in the wind. Hinata knew better though as her Byakugan had already foreseen where her opponent was. Hinata began concentrating chakra on her palms as she began to thin it out like a sharp thread, as she began weaving around her area of what seemed like a net of repelling chakra. Shugo Hakrokajianshu, Guardian of the Eight Trigrams, 64 Palms The man's blade from atop was parried and deflected away from his hands, as he was suddenly caught in the dome of the repelling chakra net hitting him in every part of his body as it seemed like a thousand needles had just rained and was piercing his skin in a sharp and continuous amount of pain. Hinata wasn't done yet, 
As she put the base of her palms adjacent to each other in a vertical manner with her palms open she struck the man in the middle of his chest. Iseo I Tendo. Sixteenth Moon Night Heaven Dance. Chakra shot out of her palms piercing the man at the chest, destroying every chakra pathway as the lights of the energy pierced the man riddling his body like bullets. The man convulsed in the dare and was blasted away by the force of the attack. Hinata turned around. Another member had appeared, this time from the ground. The member lunged at her with his katana drawn. She gritted her teeth. Defeating the first one was not an easy feat, and facing another one was just a problem waiting to pile up, one after another. Hinata then bared it with gritted teeth, even if these people were stronger than her, if it meant that she would defend Naruto with her life, then she would wholeheartedly do so as she did before. This is my last gamble. Juho Saushiken Gentle step twin lion fists. She could feel the chakra on her hands glowing and dancing like wildfire as a pair of lion heads had began to take shape on her palms. For the person that I love. I will do anything. That confident smile that she had shown now was all the answer that the ANBU shall get before she thrusts the attack straight to the man's body. Sakura. For most of the onslaught that occurred, Sakura stayed behind the lines and began treating injuries left and right. She had a competent medical staff to her aid and a very responsive medical unit at her disposal. The samurai may be no slouch and posed an even more intimidating figure than the NBU, but they were people that specialized in combat more, while shinobi branched out in different areas. Versatile, the samurai were not. Get the antidotes ready for anyone who gets poisoned, have all the injured place in one area, Separate the people those who are in mild and in critical injuries. Make the area for the critically injured close to our proximity as possible. Divide this unit into teams of three, three for every patient that are in critical condition, one for every mildly injured person. Make sure you all have your soldier pills for an additional chakra boost. Sakura began yelling orders left and right. Being the apprentice of the Godame Hokage, she knew more what was normal for her age. Tsunade considered her a prodigy in this field, with a potential to surpass her one day. Sakura began skimming through the notes as medics from left and right began delivering the wounded one by one, with some of them obtaining wounds themselves though minor. She stopped for a moment, looking sharp as she could feel the killing intent well up from underneath the earth. She then commanded for the medic corps to stand back as she wore her black gloves and said, Never underestimate a medic neem. Sakura punched the ground in such a violent manner that the ground beneath her shattered. Fissures and slabs of earth rose up and spiked revealing a rude shinobi that had been stalking them for quite some time. Sakura cracked her knuckles once again and said, Nobody messes with my friends. With that, Sakura darted like a lightning bolt, already on top of the man that had shook of his dizziness, dodging another chakra-induced punch that further caved the ground below. Sakura then jumped, as the man began to breathe out fireballs at him with a hausenka. With a twist of her body in midair, she dodged the fireballs and raised her right leg above her head. She had seen Tsunade Shersho do this often when she was training her. Tsunade drilled it into her mind that a medic nin's job was to not be allowed to be hit. Dodging became first nature to her. She had become proficient at it that Tsunade said that many people would mistake her to have the Sharingan. Another was that medic needs only fight as a last resort. Given that a medic was a vital part of the team, fighting was not an option, however if worse came to worse then fighting would be the obvious choice. It was in times like these that Tsunade had taught her fiercely aside from medical jutsu. Tsutenkiaku. Painful sky leg. The ground-shattering heel strike to ground shook the man of his bearings as Sakura had suddenly appeared on his side. Grabbing him by the nook of his shirt, Sakura tossed the man in midair with her nearly monstrous Tsunade-like strength and punched the man hard in the gut piercing through organs and with the lower half of the spinal column shattering from the blow. Kakashi and Guy had appeared just in time to provide as backup. Kakashi was concerned about the Hokage who had ran off and fought Danzo on his own so he went back to find Sakura in case there was a backlash of this new type of power that the Hokage had accidentally accumulated. He had known that Naruto was feeling the stress levels of the political talks was reaching him at boiling point, add to the fact that Sasuke appeared and disrupted the meeting in facing Madara about the truth behind the Uchiha clan. 
Kakashi wasn't surprised that all of these revelations after revelations mentally exhausted Naruto so much that it left him quite frustrated about the whole thing. Guy, on the other hand, appeared just in time to double-check the medic Nin core, with the brunt of the assault force fighting off the root forces along with the leader of iron, Guy thought it would be more prudent to be on guard for the medic Nin Corps. Besides, out in the battlefield was Niji and Shikamaru. Guy would trust these people would be okay on their own. He just wished that the Hokage would keep his cool. He had noticed that Naruto started to slump a little when they were about to exit the gates, and from the bags under the Hokage's eyes, it showed the fatigue that settled within him. He wasn't sure if he could leave him alone like that. After all, almost half of the attacks that was dealt to Sasuke was Naruto's doing, and he could see just how much it pained Naruto in doing so. Kakashi seemed to mutter something along the lines of, It's the valley of the end all over again. When they were in the hallways a little earlier, Guy had not personally heard about this particular mission from Niji, as the boy refused to tell about it. As it was, Niji didn't want to talk about a mission that was an utter failure, and even though Niji got to open up, some of the accounts after Niji's and Lee's battles were missing. So he didn't know what exactly occurred at the end of the mission that led to its failure. It was then that two rude ninja had appeared right in front of them, from the disposition that each of them gave. They were probably high in Danzo's rankings. Well, well, looks like I'll get to see more action after all. Kakashi then unfurled the Sharingan covered from his forehead protector, and gave a simple hand seal. Guy merely went for his Gukin stance. Sakura, go and see to Hokage-sama. Hanada is near his vicinity. She should be able to tell what occurred and what might happen. Kakashi commanded the pink-haired Chunin who nodded. Keep Hokage-sama safe and uninjured. We will handle this and catch up to you in a moment. Guy continued, not taking his eyes off their opponents. Sakura nodded and ran off towards the Hokage, who was mere minutes away in killing the leader of Root. Naruto Rage, indescribable fury welled from within Naruto's mind. Nothing could be compared to what he had felt when Danzo mentioned his actions against his mother. He could feel his anger rising and brewing like a storm back then. Naruto could only see red at that time. This anger and rage that he felt was worse when Kabuto almost killed Tsunade, when Sasuke left Kanoha, worse than Jiraiya's death. It had hit him hard, harder than anything he could have felt. Was it the same for Sasuke when he saw his family die over and over again? Naruto couldn't answer that question for the moment, for he had poised the kunai at Danzo's throat, the man responsible for ruining his and Sasuke's lives. The man that indirectly destroyed Konoha by allying with himself with a questionable leader, the man that had been under suspicion of using Akatsuki to kill the Sandame, his grandfather figure, Naruto couldn't stand such the repulsive man before him. It only brought on his anger and unending hatred of the man so much. With that, he had brought down the hammer of justice upon the wicked man that was Danzo, and impaled the man by the right shoulder. The old man grunted in pain as he felt the blade of the weapon piercing his flesh. Blood began to damp Danzo's kimono, oozing out to where the kanai was impaled. The man looked at Naruto who was looking at him with rage-filled eyes, eyes of malice and wrath, eyes that could set fire to any object it sees. And right now, those eyes were piercing Danzo to the very pits of his soul. Death is a punishment too good for someone like you, you piece of shit. I have a better one in mind. Naruto then let his chakra focus to a single point of his right index finger. The chakra flickered and sparked brightly as Naruto then began to point it at Danzo's forehead. Naruto then began carving the seal with his chakra on the man's forehead. It was an improvised seal that he had come up on the fly from his training a few days ago. Carving the character void on the old warhawk's forehead, Naruto then proceeded to his hand seal sequence then. He had intended to use this as a restraining measure if ever he encountered Sasuke on his way to the summit, but he couldn't exactly test this on Kakashi as it would have brought problems at an initial test. But to Danzo, he could do this without restraint, without holding back, without as much as a problem. He first started with the seal of the board to suppress what he wanted to suppress, Danzo's Sharingan. Then he proceeded to use the seal of the ever-noble tiger, the destroyer of all things the symbol of flames and power. The rat for spreading the seal and start the connection of the network within Danzo's chakra system, and finally the ram to finish and mold the chakra to a single focal point. 
With that, Naruto touched the forehead of the extremist leader again, and the seal had glowed. Within seconds, Danzo could feel his Sharingan suddenly vanish from his right eye, like somehow, it deactivated. He could feel his chakra coils move to a standstill for a second and then a few minutes later, he couldn't feel his chakra anymore, he felt himself fall beneath the lowest of the low, as he felt utterly powerless to the boy that stood before him those cross eyes showing that undeniably heated glare against him. He could feel that the Hokage had wanted to do more than just seal away both his chakra and Sharingan, but the restraint from the man was unbelievable. Naruto then could feel his sage chakra and the biji chakra dying down from him, as he knelt over the body of Danzo and began pummeling the beaten man on the ground. All the while, Naruto was crying his tears out. Bastard. You killed her. You killed her. You ruined my life. You ruined our lives. Naruto kept pounding, pouring all his anger and sadness into his fists. I wanted to kill you. I wanted to murder you. Make you feel pain before finally lobbing of your head. Another set of punches flew on the man, as Naruto continued pounding the man on his face as he broke Danzo's jaw. The answer to peace is understanding, Naruto, remember that. The voice of Jiraiya echoed in his mind. Flashback. Mama. Where are you? A crying three-year-old Naruto walked through the hallway of their tiny apartment, looking for his mother. I had a nightmare. Naruto continued between sobs, holding his closed hands to his eyes, trying to dry out the tears. Where are you, mama? Naruto continued. Thunder echoed throughout the house. A rainstorm had occurred that night. Naruto was crying, calling out for his beloved mother's voice. I'm scared. I'm cold. Where did you go? Flashback end. Naruto continued to pound the man's face as he could feel all of his anger and his rage balled into one moment. Naruto punched the old war hawk to the face before he finally screamed all of his anguish out in the open. As Naruto stood up, he could feel his eyes began to water more. As tears began turning to blood, Naruto coughed out more blood from his mouth as he looked onto the snow-covered ground. He knelt down and finally collapsed. Red and blue marks began appearing on his right hand, as he slowly fell into unconsciousness. Right here, Naruto-chan. A voice echoed through his mind before slowly succumbing to the darkness. Chapter 8. Disillusioned Mama! Mama! Look! A three-year-old Naruto shouted, holding the sleeve of his mother, tugging it with all of his might, a childish grin plastered on his face as he held out a paper with doodles and colors from a three-year-old. The lady with the red hair then kneeled down, looking at the paper her son drew. A gentle smile escaped her lips. This is wonderful, Narachan. Is this me? Naruto nodded fervently. Kushina smiled and embraced her son lovingly feeling proud and happy for her son's affection. Naruto peeked in the small dark room in the dead of the night, carrying a small blanket with him. The boy then gently woke his mother, shoving her arm. Kushina woke up, disheveled from her sudden abruption in her sleep, seeing the crying form of Naruto carrying a small blanket. Mama, I had a nightmare. I dreamt I was being eaten by a monster. The blonde ushered between sobs. Kushina gently smiled and moved to the side of her bed, motioning for Naruto to come over. The small boy then climbed the bed as Kushina uttered to her son, Don't worry, Mama's here. I won't let anything happen to you. Naruto felt the comfortable bliss of sleep once again, as he slowly dozed off in Kushina's embrace. Thunder echoed throughout the hallways. As Naruto was startled awake, the boy immediately got up as he began to cry again. He looked around and then got down. He got through the familiar room he had always went. Once he was inside, he found the bed empty. Panicking, the blonde began looking around the house, running to where his little legs could take him. He ran around the house, looking at the bathroom, then to the living room, shouting for his mother. Mama! Mama! Where are you? he shouted, throughout the darkness of their house as rain began pelting from outside, thunder echoed again to the hallway of the small house. I had a nightmare. Naruto continued between sobs, holding his closed hands to his eyes, trying to dry out the tears. Where are you, mama? Naruto continued. Thunder echoed throughout the house. A rainstorm had occurred that night. 
Naruto was crying, calling out for his beloved mother's voice. I'm scared. I'm cold. Where did you go? Right here, Naruto-chan. Naruto instantly dashed towards the area where he had heard the voice of his beloved mother, who was kneeling on the ground, sweat falling from her brow as she looked absolutely disheveled and tired. Naruto, in distraught, charged towards her mother and embraced her. I had a nightmare again, he began. As he embraced her, Kushina hugged his little child in the back, ignoring the pain on her back. She lulled Naruto in her sweet embrace. She gritted her teeth, unknown to Naruto, as the pain of the poisoned kunai started doing its job. It was acting fast, coursing through her body like quicksilver. She knew she was going to die and leave Naruto behind, but not before giving Naruto one last goodbye. As the young blonde hugged her with all his might, Kushina felt her resolve collapse a little. Embracing Naruto in the tightest way as she can, she couldn't show the distraught face of a mother now. Naruto needed her. In the midst of her endearing and final embrace, Kushina began to sing to her son. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mommy's going to buy you a mockingbird. As Kushina sang that song, she could feel her son's breathing slowing down and her tears starting to fall. She couldn't bear to leave her son alone in this world. Amongst the crowd of people that hated him, in a world where they would use him, no one could protect him, she feared for the worst. As she continued to sing, she willed herself to get up through sheer determination and placed her son on his bed all the while singing the song that her son loved so much. She kissed her son on the cheeks as she tucked her son on his bed. She could feel her voice waver and her salty tears brushed on her lips. As she stood up, she had two more stanzas left of the song. And if that horse and cart fall down, you'll still be the sweetest little boy in town. One more stanza, one more parting gift to her son. It was getting harder to speak let alone pay attention. She had to be strong. For Naruto. Damn it, just one more. So hush little baby, don't you cry. Daddy loves you and so. Do. I. As she went out, she had closed Naruto's door gently. Thud. Naruto opened his eyes. The scent of antiseptic filled his nose, and the white ceiling of the room made him realize he was in the hospital. He groaned and looked around. There were several cords attached to his chest, hearing the beeping sounds of the machine giving off sharp lines up and down. It is a relief to see you are finally awake. He turned his head to look at the source of the voice and found Mifun who was leaning against the wall, parallel to his bed. You have been out for forty-eight hours, Hokage Dano. Naruto groaned again, he sat up, stretching his sore back muscles and asked Mifun, what happened, Mifun-san? The attempted usurpation to the alliance has fallen. Your plan was excellent. Mifun replied, as he then continued, Danzo has been detained into one of our cells, all remnants of his forces in this country had been wiped out and we have very minimal to low amounts of casualties. If it not for your medic, we would have far worse. I commend your predecessor on teaching such an excellent apprentice of hers. Naruto only nodded. He saw that his abdomen had bandages, as did his cheek and his right shoulder. He flexed his right arm and clenched his hands into fists, finding that it too had bandages on its own. Sakura had soon stormed inside Naruto's room. A quite irate cherry blossom-haired girl had met her holding a chart in her hands and shouted to the blonde, Don't be so reckless, Hokage-sama. Naruto flinched at the tone of her voice as she continued, Did you know what happened to you? Mifune then stepped out of the room, obviously uncomfortable at the tongue lashing that Sakura was delivering to the captain commander. Internal hemorrhage of the worst kind, that's what. Some of the major blood vessels were ruptured, it turned to aneurysm. Sakura then looked at the chart. There were multiple signs of internal hemorrhage in Naruto's body, organ punctures, lacerated blood vessels, and even an awful case of pneumothorax. In one episode, Naruto's lungs had almost collapsed. If it wasn't for Kyuubi right now, Naruto would have surely died. When finding out the cause of the said thing, Hinata had explained that the two opposing chakras of nature and the Kyuubis caused a violent reaction over time that the stored chakra in the cells began to disintegrate to a point where the very cellular structure began falling apart. The regeneration of Naruto's wounds had worked faster than it originally had though, 
Sakura had to wonder just how it happened. The strength and seal of the fourth was probably there to be thankful for. As she skimmed through Naruto's chart, Sakura began to speak. We thought you we could have lost you, you know, she said in a somber tone. Naruto remained quiet, looking down. When you fought Danzo, I guess your anger was at your limit. Naruto couldn't reply. He had no words to tell about what happened. Instead, he remained quiet and stared the sheets draped over him that kept him warm. He balled his hands into fists, ruffling the blanket on top of him. But that doesn't excuse you why you have to be so rash, Naruto. Naruto flinched yet again. You're always like this. You're willing to sacrifice yourself just so you could finish something. Don't you know that all of us were concerned when you were near the brink of death? Just this once, Naruto, just. Don't do things that could lead to your death. We've lost Sasuke-kun already. I'm not about to lose you too. Don't try to push yourself further than you already have. Another round of tongue lashings came. Naruto couldn't very well reply. He was too preoccupied about that dream he had just had. Or to be more precise, a memory he never knew he had. Are you even listening to me? Sakura griped. Naruto nodded absent-mindedly. He stared over the window as he watched the snow outside gently falling on the white ground. His memory, though vague, had a sudden recalling of his mother. He didn't know why he would forget such memories of someone very dear to him, someone who had showed love to him. Something must have happened prior to his mother's death. Something made him stop remembering. The question was, why? I'm sorry, Sakura. It's been one hell of a ride, realizations after one another, unbearable truths about my past, about Sasuke's. I can't believe it. All my life, it was dictated by the people in the higher-ups of the village or more precisely, someone who manipulated everything underground. The same person that was responsible in instigating such a terrible act against Sasuke's family, and mine as well. After what Danzo said about me, I could only see red. Sakura stood there quietly. Naruto held his head for a moment, and said with a dejected smile as he leaned back, How could I forget my own mother like that? This time... It was Sakura's turn to be speechless. Back then, she would have said that Naruto was an idiot that forgot someone important like his mother. It was enlightening to say the least, as Sakura realized the horrors of her past actions towards her team. She had never bothered back then to look at her teammates beyond that of their shown attitudes, but by the time she had started doing so, it was already far too late to do anything with them. Sasuke had drifted away from them. Naruto was already going away for his training trip with Jiraiya. She had to learn about her teammates through hours of sneaking through shinobi profiles after her training sessions with Tsunade. She didn't want to say anything anymore, she didn't want to pry anymore, and any type of stress wouldn't be good for Naruto. It was enough that Naruto made that decision with Sasuke, Shikamaru had been right with him all along. With that, she said to Naruto, Get some rest, Hokage-sama. I don't know what happened back there with Danzo. I won't pry. But whatever it is that's bothering you right now, please settle it quickly. The rakage has left in search of his brother two days ago, while the other kages remain to discuss some of the preparations with you. Once Sakura was outside, everyone from Kanoha looked over at the pink-haired Kunoichi and told them that Naruto was now awake, and soon, the three remaining kages and the leader of Iron went inside. Sakura, however, tried to stop them, the Hokage was still recovering. It was met with an urgent stare coming from the Tsuchikage. The old man said to her, that may be, but this war takes precedence above all. Every human life is at stake here. Recovery time can be given to him on a much more lax period. Once inside, the three remaining leaders of each respective village stood dignified before the Kage of Fire Country. All of them wore stoic expressions and calculating looks. Gara spoke his voice laced with the formality like any other diplomat. Hokage Dano, we commend you for your strategy in exterminating the forces that threatened the alliance. Also, after you lost consciousness, the five of us had disputed over the potential candidacy of the Supreme Commander. This time, Mifune stepped in. We can't risk you being exposed to the battlefield this early on, Hokage Dano, but we can't also risk you not being there, the fact that you have veritable strategic knowledge of the battlefield. We can't let you be sent to the front lines. Naruto had immediately interjected, What? 
that Sechikaj spoke, Indeed, I may have considered the hosts of the Hachibi and the Kubi to be a very vital part on the front lines when we are out there, but it is also a fact that your chakras are painfully obvious once you let the beast out, a factor which I have forgotten about the Jinchuriki. Naruto see that at that for a moment, with his hands balled into fists, the Mizukage had quickly added, You are a vital part of the war, Hokage Dano. We lose you and the Eight Tails host, we lose everything. I'm sorry, Hokage Dano, but we can't have you being enlisted as a part of the forces in this war. Strategic meetings that will commence on the Alliance will be held in secret. With only the six of us talking like this, we will hide your location as to where that meeting will take place. And the one that shall take over as the second in command will be Reikage Dano that will pose as the supreme commander up front. Naruto wanted to protest, but he knew that the other leaders were right. He still hasn't found a way yet to counter Madara's time-space manipulation. Naruto then asked, Has the Reikage accepted? All of the Kages and the leader of Iron nodded. The Kazakage then added, Not only that, Sechikage Dano has also given us information on some of Madara's techniques being one of the people that Madara had fought long ago. The Tsuchikage then looked asked, What of the prisoner? I have questions I need answered from the man, and if I can pull this off, we may be able to reduce the numbers of Akatsuki members forcing Madara into a corner. Naruto held his chin for a moment, and then said to the leaders, Is there anything else that you need to tell me? All of them shook their heads. Naruto answered, Then let me get some rest for now, as soon as you can. Go back to your respective villages and start preparing. For now, we need to determine Akatsuki's main base of operations since AIM has withdrawn its support from Akatsuki. With that, the leaders had exited the room, the rest of the Kanoha ninja hurriedly entered the room, fully intent on knowing what had just occurred, and the war that the Tsuchikage mentioned. What's going on, Hokage-sama? What did the Tsuchikage mean that we're going to war? Asked Chikamaru. He eyed the Hokage who was looking out at the snow-littered skies of Iron Country from his bed. Akatsuki declared war on the five main hidden villages seeing as they now have seven of the nine Bija. We decided to form an alliance to counter the threat. Before that, they terrorized the summit itself. Guess who was with them? Shikamaru didn't like where this was going. He was frowning the whole way as he said the name, Sasuke. Naruto solemnly nodded. Sakura looked horrified for a moment. She was shaking visibly at the thought of Sasuke being part of a terroristic attack on the summit. Sasuke may be calm, but he had an impulse worse than Naruto and was almost always taciturn when it came to his goals. Her voice shaking, she said to Naruto, W what's going to happen to Sasuke-kun now? Naruto gave a sigh as he stared up on the ceiling of his room and said, I can't pardon him Sakura, he's assaulted the five Kaigas and no one can deny he's part of Akatsuki now. However, it turns out that Madara is brainwashing Sasuke to do his bidding. So there may be hope yet. One last chance, Sakura. We have one last chance to get him back or at least defect from Madara. Kakashi had answered for Naruto. Sakura looked grim for a moment. Was this how it's all going to end? Now could you please let me get some rest? Tomorrow, I'll have a talk with our old friend, Danzo. His subordinates nodded all at once and began exiting out the door. But not before Hinata had said to the Hokage. I'm glad that you're safe, Hokage-sama. Naruto looked quizzical for a moment. Confusion littered his mind. Until he remembered the day she had confessed to him. Naruto seemed to let out a melancholic smile as he said, Stay for a moment, Hinata. I still have to say something. Hinata stopped reaching for the doorknob as she looked at Naruto. She could feel her heart beat faster than ever. Her face died with the red of her blood crawling to her cheeks. W what is it? It was that stutter again. She knew for a fact that she had been slowly getting over her shy face. But it was harder now that Naruto seemed ready to answer her. Sit down for a moment and relax. This won't take ten minutes. Hinata did as she was told. Naruto then continued. I'm sorry if I didn't get to talk to you sooner about this but I had a lot of things to take care of. Hinata shook her head at this. It's no problem, Naruto-kun. Naruto seemed to chuckle lightly at this as he continued, You know you're always too kind for your own good sometimes. Hinata seemed flustered for a moment there as Naruto continued with a smile, But then I guess that's why I like people like you, Hinata. You're always looking out for everybody, 
even when you knew I was going to fight your cousin three years ago. It's no big deal, Naruto-kun. I just gave you words of encouragement. I'm glad that I was one of the reasons why you wanted to win against Niji Nizan. Hinata replied with a serene smile on her face. Naruto gave a soft laugh as he looked down. I guess you have a way with words, Hinata. Remember that mission back then when we went to hunt down Itachi? Hinata nodded. Naruto then said, looking back, I was a bit tense when we started. I was nervous. We were about to go on a hunt for a ninja that was clearly beyond our league back then. I was nervous of the fact that Itachi might kill one of you guys and me being taken away. But you cheered me up and told me to do my best. It's been a while since I felt that much lighter than normal. Like somehow, I have felt the weight I was carrying was lighter. Again, the blonde gave a small laugh as he said, I never got to thank you for that. Hinata gave an earnest reply, I it's enough that you were encouraged by me. A blush escaped her cheeks yet again. Naruto gave her one of his patented grins for a moment, until he looked serious, as he continued to stare on the ivory-white ceiling. Then, pain attacked, you jumped right in front of me, just in time before I was taken away. But most importantly, you said those three words that stopped me dead in my tracks for a moment. Hinata didn't say anything, right now. She wanted to hear what Naruto wanted to tell her. I've never really understood what love was, in a romantic sense. I thought that I just wanted to protect everyone, like Nagato wanted for his precious people. He just wanted to protect his friends that grew as his family. A silent pause echoed through the room as Naruto then said, Do you regret anything that you said to me, Hinata? I don't regret anything that I have said, Naruto-kun, it's the truth. I've been in love with you since we were children. That fact will never change, she said with a warm smile that Naruto grinned at. It was the same sweet Hinata that he had known since they were children, only now, she seemed more confident than anything. Naruto was somewhat proud of what Hinata had become. It was one of the things that made him smile, somewhat, that one of his friends had been. Well, I don't know, I'm flattered Hinata, but I still don't know. I've been fighting for recognition all of my life. Every time I talk to you, I can't help but feel at ease. With Sakura it's different. I don't know, Hinata, it's just... I don't feel like I can pursue a relationship yet. Hell, I don't even think I should be Hokage at the moment. To me, Tsunade Bachan is still the Hokage that loves to drink and gamble all her money when she thinks we don't know. Naruto said that in an amused tone, letting out a small laugh. Please don't force yourself to answer my confession, naruto Quinn. She immediately said as she looked none too amused. Take your time. Don't think you can address this whenever you can. I would like it if you take your time and finally know what you truly feel about me. Please don't force yourself. Sincerity was laced in that voice. Naruto returned his melancholic smile. Thank you, Hinata. You really do have a way with words. I'm sure you'll make a fine clan head and a great wife someday. Another set of blushes escaped Hinata's cheeks. She had never expected this though, Naruto suddenly talking about this topic so soon, he didn't accept her, but at least didn't reject her. She stood up with a smile on her face, somewhat relieved at that moment. She could feel that she still had a chance and said to Naruto, It's not my nature to give up though, Naruto-kun. You know that's our... I know. Our Nindo. Naruto interjected with a smile, happy that Hinata had accepted his explanation for now. With that, she went away and closed the door. Naruto could feel himself drift back to sleep. He had never slept so well before in his life. Konoha Tsunade sat before three of her ninjas who were kneeling in front of her. It had been nearly two weeks since the battle with pain, and she could feel every muscle in her body ache due to the stasis that they had been put through. Tsunade looked around the tent. Her vision was still blurry as she could feel the effects of some of the drugs that had been given to her during her coma. She cursed her dizziness at the moment. The seemingly strong drug had rightfully affected her so. She was cranky two days ago, more so than she is right now. The noise just outside of her tent two days ago woke her up in such a rude and abrupt manner that her temper flared to volumes of one who was suffering from an alcohol withdrawal. The noise outside was as subtle as a hammer for a ninja and the battle inside was none too pleasing as well. Flashback two days ago. The sound of metal clashing against metal was heard outside of the tent, 
with people constantly screaming outside along with techniques pouring out like rainwater. A small black mouse had crept into the white tent that Tsunade was sleeping in. It scurried around the vials and bottles of herbs and medicines until it had stopped on in four stand. The small mouse sniffed and squeaked as it stood on the four stand. All at once, five beasts made of ink had hopped into the small room as they began to pounce on the seemingly harmless force stand that instantly popped revealing a root division member who dodged the attack of the animated creatures. The voice of the man seemed monotonous as he mentioned to the figure that was sitting outside the wall. Are you betraying the organization? The figure didn't say anything as the ink lions began growling and circling their prey, stalking the victim before finally moving for the kill. The beast to his right soon lunged at the man who sidestepped and grabbed his blade, slashing it in the abdomen, dispelling the clone. The ink splashed to the floor as the rest of the lions did so while growling and snarling at the man. The ink beast to the left then swooped below, attempting to bite the ankle. The ANBU dodged by folding his knees below before jumping and he thrusts his katana on the ink beast's face dispelling it as well. The said man was about to do a jutsu but he was cut off seeing as the beasts would not let him do anything. The wolves kept chasing the ANBU down on the tent, clashing and avoiding every snarling creature and forcing to run around, taking down medical racks and herbal bottles and medicine shattering on the ground. A few minutes into the match, the man was suddenly grabbed by the throat by the hand of one very pissed-looking Tsunade. The man was about to stab Tsunade in the gut until she drove the man's face on the glass-ridden floor of her tent. Blood splattered on the ground as the man's face was embedded with countless shards of sharp broken glass. I was taking a nap, God damn it! Can't you little shits be quiet just for once? The man was then literally tossed outside colliding with the three root ANBU forces that served as a decoy. Tsunade walked outside, clenching her fists as it began to sound in cracks. The busty Hokage then charged at the three ANBU with a speed that surprised them Tsunade had appeared just right in front of them about to deliver a devastating kick that could absolutely kill them then sent to lower earth orbit. Tsunade shouted in all of her strength, Get. Out. The four ninjas were punted into the air as they felt some of their bones shatter from the Godame's strength. Aoba and Genma were speechless. The lady then turned her head around to the three flabbergasted ninja on her back with a scowl on her face as she said, What the hell is going on here? Flashback and Sure enough, halfway to Genma, Aoba and Shizen's explanations, Tsunade was now rubbing her temples on the headaches and paperwork about to be done. For once, just for once she wanted to act sick again and leave the Kage's work behind. She was going to pound Danzo for his insurgency. Nobody messes with the Hokage. All right, where's Danzo? I'm going to give him a beating that he'll never forget before I decide what to do with him. Tsunade cracked her knuckles for a moment. The three Jounin looked at each other with Aoba saying, Danzo is an iron country, Godame sama Right now, we have sent an approximate two teams to capture and or neutralize any of Danzo's root forces. He was supposed to assassinate Rokadame sama Wait, Rokadame. What? Why was a new Hokage instated quickly? Who's the new Hokage? Tsunade asked furiously. Now both her hands were held on their heads, that was until Shizen replied to her. Uzumaki Naruto is the Rokudame, Tsunade-sama. He was instated in such short notice due to the Kage summit taking place. Tsunade paled at the name and the event. She could feel her blood draining from her face as she imagined Naruto being in the event as the representative at Konoha. The name Naruto and the word summit and diplomacy could in no way fit in the same sentence without some sort of catastrophic event. Tsunade sighed in exasperation as she held her hands high. Who was the idiot that nominated him in the first place? He's still far too young, inexperienced in dealing with politics, and the people are letting him run the village. It was the Lord of Fire, Tsunade-sama. He elected Naruto-sama to his current position with the support of the council. If it wasn't for Naruto-sama, Danza would have probably been the Rokudame. Tsunade wanted sake, now? There's more to this, isn't there? Tsunade questioned. All three jounins in the room looked at each other and shrugged. Outside, Sai was somewhat feeling nervous. He didn't show it as he didn't know how to, but from his mannerisms, he could feel that he couldn't just report to the Godame right now. The pale boy then turned around and mumbled somehow, I feel like I'll die when I enter there. 
I'll just report this when the Rokadame arrives. With that, Sa was off going to an apartment that Yamato had created earlier on. Iron Country, the next day. Naruto was in his full uniform, bandages removed as the regeneration of his body finished last night. He was standing in front of the doors on the cell that held the infamous leader of Root. Once inside, Naruto removed his red and black Hayori, and sat down on the chair right in front of Danzo. A single drop light was all there was in the room that illuminated the table in between Naruto and Danzo. Hokage-sama, it is well that you could visit me in this time of the day. He said that statement in a mocking tone. Naruto merely glared at the man and stared Danzo straight in the eye. I don't have any intentions of mundane talk here, Danzo. I want answers. Why did you attack the summit? Danzo replied, a small grin escaped from his lips. Why should I tell you? You have no business in knowing about my goals. Naruto sat there patiently and asked again, Why did you attack the summit? None of your concern. Naruto had immediately put up a hand seal and soon found Danzo writhing in agony on his chair. Naruto then asked, Why did you attack the summit? If I had succeeded, you would see the reason why. Sarutobi thought it was possible to coexist with the other villages through diplomacy. In case of emergencies within the elemental countries, meetings such as the Five Kages Summit is a vital part in regards to peace. I oppose that idea. Danzo then continued, giving a country free reigns upon their agendas as well as privacy is an act of leniency. People are notorious for treachery and switching sides when it is time to bite the knife. Human minds do not work like that. People are selfish, greedy, war-mongering brutes. They wage wars to gain more from their adversaries and grow strong. Resources are limited. That is why countries clamor to gain more resources to grow from the destruction of others. If you do not sway with the tides, then you shall crash and burn. What are you getting at? Asked Naruto. I want it for Konoha to become an empire, a nation worthy to be feared, the five main hidden villages along with the rest of its allies, united under the emblem of Kanahagakur no Sado. Naruto scowled at Danzo, you intend to conquer the five main hidden villages and in the process, envelop the whole continent under one flag? Danzo then replied, it is truly a shame that I had failed in doing so. We were about to infiltrate as well, it seems like there is a rat among my subordinates. What subordinates? Naruto asked, his scowl never left his face. Danzo was silenced for a moment there. He eyed Naruto in a scowl of his own as the Rokadame stood from his seat and turned to his right. I had the samurai ordered to cut down any ninja that stood in their path. You gave me no choice. As long as you have your cronies with you, shit like this will happen any time. I can't allow that. Then why didn't you finish me off? Asked Danzo. Naruto merely replied, I still have questions that need answered. Do you think I'll answer after what you've done to me? Danzo could still feel the lingering effects of the seal. After the boy had sealed away the Sharingan and his chakra, Danzo felt all of his work slip away from his hands. How a sculptor loses his hands in making statues, Danzo lost the defining factor that made him a ninja. Nothing would ever bring his dream to ever come true right now. All he had was a useless transplanted right eye and his own crippled body. Nothing could ever be crueler than living through life without the thing that you held so dear with you. I'm the one asking questions, Danzo. You're not supposed to ask one. Naruto retorted. You're not very good at it. Don't test me, bastard. Naruto threatened. His anger was about to show its head again. Danzo seemed unfazed. Naruto then approached Danzo and held the man by the collar. I want to know one thing. Did you wipe my memories during my childhood? As vague as a memory of a three-year-old is, there has to be at least my memory of my mother in there. Did you have something to do with it? Danzo had that gleam in his eye for a moment, a gesture that Naruto hadn't noticed. Danzo replied in a calm voice, Do you want to know? Naruto remained silent. Danzo replied, That gleam from his eye never vanished. I suggested it to the advisors once word had gotten out that Kushina was killed. Danzo continued, It is well known that Jinchuriki manifest their powers when they are upset. Childhood is a very important for the host to develop a sound mind. Without someone to guide you, your mental state would have collapsed as soon as you found out about your mother's demise. You'd be taciturn. Your mood changes would have brought out destruction of the village, 
so I told the advisors of Saratobi of a way to prevent that. So in order to do that, you wiped out my memories of my mother? Asked Naruto. Danzo merely replied, You sound like it was I who ordered that your memory be altered. I only gave the suggestion. Let me tell you something, Rokadame. All decisions regarding about you back then should be filtered by the Hokage before being approved. Why do you think I haven't had the chance to use you as the ultimate soldier for my armies? Why do you think you were so untouchable when you were a child? The most awful thing ever being done to you was the ignorance and stares from the villagers. Danzo asked rhetorically. Naruto merely stood silent as he stared at Danzo in contempt. He shoved the man back to his chair and walked to the side of the table. If anything, you should blame Harizen. He was the one who authorized to do what happened to you. Danzo replied. Naruto shouted to the man, Shut up. Naruto grabbed a kanai from his pouch and tossed it on the table near Danzo. He wouldn't believe what this man would say. No, there was no way the Sandame would allow that to happen to him. He wouldn't do that to him. The man he trusted was like the grandfather he never had. He would never do this, never approve of it. Oh? In denial are we? How much time did you spend with Saratobi? How many times did he look so distant and so thoughtful when he stared at you? Like something he had regret as he was with you. You have been desensitized by his sugar-coated words and kindness that you have forgotten what he did to you. Oh wait, you wouldn't remember because your memories were altered. Danzo replied. Naruto seemed to freeze at that for a moment. He didn't look at the crippled warhawk at that moment. Naruto clenched his fists. There is no black and white. All there is, is the shade of gray. There is no absolute in this world except for life and death. The Sandame, for all his intents and purposes, is much of a sinner as I am. Danzo explained, chuckling from his seat. Naruto couldn't stand the man anymore. He exited the room and closed the door behind, slamming it shut. Naruto walked outside in haste. He began climbing the stairs in his own pace, troubled from Danzo's statement. The young leader then cursed under his breath and angrily pounded on the wall with his right hand, cursing Danzo's name as he did so. Never had he thought Konoha housed skeletons in its closet better left unknown, and it seemed to involve a lot of the prominent families that reside within Konoha as well. Be it a member of the Hokage's family or an infamous clan, there seemed to be countless secrets that Tsunade herself didn't even know. Once he had met with his subordinates near his quarters, he said to them, Prepare for the journey back to Kanoha. The sooner we get there, the sooner we settle things over there. I need to find out what happened to Tsunade Bachan, and question the advisors on their decisions. In quick haste, the Kanoha ninja saluted to their leader and began doing as they were told. Outside of the Fang Ma, eastern exit, two hours later. Naruto crouched down as he waited for his subordinates to come down. He had met two teams of Konoha Shinobi, possibly there to provide as a backup against the attempted coup. Naruto then told them that Danzo was located in a prison cell below. Just ask for the name with his authorization. Once that was done, Naruto bit his thumb and summoned one of the elder toads again. Fukusaku appeared from the summoning circle in the smoke, coughing a little as he said to his summoner, Why did you bring me out here, Naruto-chan? I want to know more about Fionjutsu, Fukusaku-sensei. Also, I'd like to ask you something about the nature chakra. It seemed I accidentally mixed nature chakra and cubies during my fight with Danzo. I thought that the nature chakra would repel the bijou's chakra, but it found a moment where it remained in perfect synchronization. Fukusaku's eyes widened as he looked at the young sage. Are you saying that the nature chakra found itself neutralizing the effect of the kitsun's yuki? Naruto nodded, in a manner of speaking, yeah. I was able to synchronize myself with the nature chakra. I developed the same heightened senses as I did with the fox's chakra. What was surprising, though, was that I felt the seal on my stomach released a total of six tails worth of chakra, but I didn't even form the chakra cloak, and I could do the same tricks as when I used the bijou. Naruto looked thoughtful for a moment and continued, It had a terrible side effect, though. I suffered internal bleeding and some major blood vessels had popped. Sakura said that I suffered an aneurysm and it was only thanks to the Kyuubi's regeneration that I survived. Fukusaku began to think as he sat on the snow-covered ground, contemplating on what might have triggered such a repulsion of chakra inside Naruto like that. If the nature chakra could sink with the Kyuubi's chakra, 
Why hasn't it occurred during the invasion? Why would the Kyubi reject the fusion with Fukasaku? After much deliberation, Fukasaku jumped to the shoulders of the blonde and began his explanation. I think I may have a clue as to why the body had suffered that much damage. Naruto seemed intrigued by this. What? Do you know the aspect between Yin and Yang? Fukasaku asked his student. Naruto shook his head. That's understandable. Yin and Yang are two parts of a whole, the equilibrium or balance. Yin is the spiritual aspect or in this case, mental aspect. It is the spiritual part of chakra. Dominant Yin Jutsu use more of the mind aspect. In this case, an example of a Yin dominant Jutsu is the Nara clan's shadow techniques. Yin is stasis, inactivity, cold. Fukasaku then continued now, the Yang aspect is the physical aspect of your chakra. Dominant Yang Jutsu primarily involve changing bodily functions and structures. An example would be the activation of the Hashimin, eight gates, since it removes the limiters to one's body, the Yang aspect increases the strain that the muscles can take and along with it, reaction time and reflexes. Yang is compulsion, activity, hot. Do you follow Naruto-chan? Naruto nodded. Fukasaku smiled as he continued, good, now nature chakra has the yin and yang aspect the same as normal chakra, only that nature chakra is vastly more potent than a human's. Though it is yin dominated, it doesn't mean it is spiritual and absolute, nature chakra still has the basic physical and spiritual components. Now, if I remember correctly, the yandame separated the chakras of the kyubi, sealing the yang chakra in you and then the yin chakra into the toad scroll that Jiraiya-chan left us. The chakra repulsion of nature chakra and the cubies resulted in the inadequacy of the yin chakra to complete the cycle of yin and yang. Simply put, the yang forces of both chakras are fighting to gain the yin chakra rather than coexist. The overloaded yang chakra, instead of fusing with the cells, end up pushing each other outwards in an adverse effect. That's why it caused so much damage within the body. Naruto simplified Fukasaku's statement. In other words, the problem with me is that I don't have enough of the spiritual aspect of chakra and the incomplete energy is fighting for the limited amount? Fukasaku nodded, that is from what I can surmise. If you want to use it without limiting your usage, then there's no other way but for you to fuse with the yin chakra of the kyubi. Naruto turned silent for a moment. It was happening a lot lately. He didn't know why, but it seemed after being Hokage, he had come to reflect upon decisions that he has to make before finally giving an answer. Somehow, thinking things through before deciding was making his head a lot clearer. I'll do it. Was Naruto's only reply before he continued, but not before finishing some of my obligations in the village for a few days. I need master Fuinjutsu anyway. It would take me months, or even a few years, but I certainly need the help to do it. I've only got the basics down, and with this war that's about to happen, the sealing arts would play a vital part in it. Fukasaku nodded then, I'll have a sealing chamber prepared once you're done in Kanoha. But are you prepared, Naruto-chan? This training could eventually kill you and force the Kyubi back into the world of the living. Naruto could only reply with a nod as he said, taking risks is a gamble that's paid off for me for quite some time. This may be my biggest challenge yet, but any chance of getting stronger is a chance I'm willing to take. I can't let Madara do what he wants, and if this is one of the opportunities presented to me for getting stronger, then so be it. Fukasaku could only nod, as solemn as it is. There was only deafening silence outside Iron Country, with only the winter winds howling up on the skies. Different Location A short middle-aged man stood over an axe that was wedged in the bark of a tree. The man had thick eyebrows, as thick as a leech that was sucking up blood. His hair kept back by trying it in a punch perm bun. The man wore a traditional white shihakusho and black hakama over several layers of fishnet armor kept together by a black obi tied around his waist. The man then began to sing with his voice in a slow, rhythmic fashion, Oh, shinobi! Ever concealed! Crying silent tears! The man began to shake in passion as he held his closed right fist closed to his head as if to stop an overwhelming sense of accomplishment and excitement. You cannot simply sing. Anka is an expression of one's heart and soul, the man said trying to curb his passion for the said object. Now see if you can match me, said the man down below. A hulking giant of a dark person stood, 
wearing sunglasses to hide his eyes, hair kept back, two swords strapped on his back, with the hilts popping up just behind his right shoulder. A long scarf that surrounded his neck, his big muscular body was only covered with only leather armor and a rope like obi over his black pants. Shinobi! Sneaking about, yeah. Escaping from death. However unlike his teacher, the man couldn't very well contain his passionate emotion in music. Yaiyawa! The man shouted raising his right hand in an I love you sign. The giant tanuki on the back of the man only stared at Killer B for a few seconds. An awkward silence permeated the forest for a few seconds. This is going to be a lot of work. Sabu uttered to himself holding the bridge of his nose and palming his forehead as he bowed his head. Sabu then lectured the new student about the art of Inca. You do not have the passion. The passion? Are you not taking the song lightly? Do you not think so? Do you not see? Killer B scratched his head at this passion. Sabu then raised his arms exuberantly, yes, passion. As the name suggests, expressing the world of song through passion is the very heart of Anka. Of course, melodic embellishment. You must form your notes in your chest and circulate them in your nose. The giant tanuki growled a little as it felt a new presence entering the small clearing. Sabu looked at his pet in concern and alertness, what is it, Panta? Out from the shadows, it stepped closer into the light as both men heard the steps of sandals hitting the ground. The men stood in caution as the man's robes flapped into the cold air. His black cloak embroiled in red clouds danced at the end. The man gave a sinister laugh as he held the golden hilt of his overbearing sword. The man's blue skin was a dead giveaway for both men. There stood in front of them was the sadistic smile of the ever-violent Hashigaki Kisame. The man had never looked this amused his entire life. Chapter 9 Ripple Kisame chuckled darkly as he looked at Killer B in an amused expression. A smile escaped his lips revealing a sharp set of teeth, samahada, shark skin, on his shoulder. His sword had been rather hard-headed in chasing down the tantalizing chakra trail that the eight-tailed host had left behind. Out of all the swords of the shinobi Gatana Shishinin Shu, seven ninja swordsmen, Samahata had been the most terrifying and the only sentient sword that was ever crafted from Kiri. Many had said that the very sword itself was made from the hide of the Sambai, three tails, and it was the Yande Mizukich, Yugura himself, the one who had forged the blade and handed it over to Kisame, his most trusted adjutant. Never would anyone know more about it except for Kisame. And Kisame had never stated anything about his past, for he didn't care nor was he willing to say anything about the matter. The only thing important to Kisame was a good fight and a good fight was all he had wanted. It was a pain too much trouble when Samahara became rather persistent in tracking you down eight tails, but I can see that your delicious chakra is well worth the trouble. Kisame said in a calm fashion, showing that toothy smile. The giant raccoon named Panta growled and leaned down, ready to pounce the Akatsuki any given chance. Kisame then set his sword down, as he lowered himself to a stance, the tip of Samahada touching the ground. It was then that the giant raccoon jumped straight to Kisame, who didn't seem to flinch even a little. Iron Country Why is she traveling with us again? Asked an annoyed Sakura to no one in particular, pointing to the two kagas at her front. The Mizukage was somewhat overly forward, what with her arms wrapped around to their Hokage's left arm pressing it into her ample bosom. Naruto was feeling disheveled and turned to a bag of stutters and incoherent words from the Mizukage's affectionate gestures. Shikamaru merely gave an obvious answer. Water country is located directly to our east, Sakura. It is no surprise why they would travel with us. She doesn't have to be so clingy, though. Sakura mumbled while gritting her teeth. Kakashi, who was unabashedly reading his book in front of his subordinates and underclassmen, replied as he turned a page. It's just the way how men in power and women work. Ever saw what happened in Konoha before Hokage-sama left? Sakura seemed to recall screams from both men and women alike during the speech. However, something loomed in the little corner where most of the women were. She hadn't noticed it at first, but as soon as she thought about it, she saw the same virus that had affected her whenever she was near Sasuke, somehow spreading through the women as they saw the Hokage. Fangirls of course, she could somewhat understand the women. 
Naruto was indeed someone to look up to, and with looks that are a striking resemblance to the fourth Hokage, who was in no way ugly at the least, it was perfectly normal. But it still doesn't excuse her behavior, Sakura declared. Ao was looking ashamed as he scratched the back of his head and bowed apologetically. I am terribly sorry about our leader. Mizukage-sama is just terribly distressed of the fact that she has yet to have a potential marriage candidate. She's about to near the age of 26, and she's finding it harder and harder to search for a man to settle down with and well. Ao said to his side. The glasses-wearing swordsman was somewhat downtrodden. Oh, don't be such a gloomy little boy, Chujuro. You're a man, and there are plenty of fish in the sea. Stand tall and make Kiri proud, boy. Ao commented making the boy stand up straight. Sakura was still glaring at the two kages in front, feeling upset and annoyed at the woman. Shikamaru who was smirking merely replied, Why Sakura, don't tell me that you're Jay. Finish that sentence, and I'll shove my fist down your throat. Shikamaru sighed and made a simple reply, Whatever. Okay, try to make light of the situation, Shikamaru was never doing that again for Sakura. He forgot how hot-headed the pinket can be. He swore that the three of them, Sasuke, Sakura and Naruto, were siblings. They all had things in common one way or another. You should take your own advice though, Sakura. Kakashi interjected and turning another page as he continued. You may have the right to tell the Hokage on what he should have done, but keep in mind he's your superior now. Though I'm really proud of you for not pounding his head in between his shoulders, you know the decorum. Sakura looked at the scene in front of her and frowned, I know. It's just I can't keep myself from worrying about him when he's like that. We all do, Sakura. But it's just a part of who he is. The Hokage is as reckless as Shikamaru is as difficult to motivate. Replied Niji, Sakura sighed in aggravation as she gently elbowed Hinata, who had her Byakugan active. Hinata, how much further are we from the village? The sooner we get there, the better. Hinata somewhat snapped away from her focus as she said, somewhat stammering from losing her focus. I am sorry, Sakura-san. I wasn't focusing on the road, but I believe that the border is still far from here. Shikamaru instantly remarked, and now we have the Hyuga heiress being jealous as well. Is it just me? Or is the brunt of the female race after me and Naruto for some reason? Sakura merely gave Shikamaru a glare. The pineapple-headed Chunin turned his head up and said, Troublesome. I am curious, though. Guy looked thoughtful, Kakashi merely listened in. It was one of these moments that Guy had insightful views on some things that had gained his interest. Guy may have been eccentric, but Naruto had placed faith in the green-wearing man's skill and prowess. He wasn't the originator, and the master of the Gukan for nothing. Why would Hokage-sama keep Danzo alive? He's a dangerous criminal and even if he has no more subordinates at his disposal, there's nothing left for the man. Kakashi reiterated, it may only be a hunch, but Rokadame sama said he has a plan to reduce Akatsuki's numbers by at least more than half. Danzo may be what is needed to lure them out. Shikamaru seemed to frown at this as he asked, Why would the Hokage use that bastard as bait then? He's too dangerous. He knows more secrets in Konoha than the Godame. I'm sure any village that hates Konoha would be itching to get info on our village. Kakashi merely looked at the Nara genius and replied, that question would solely be answered by the Hokage himself at his own discretion. The reason for using Danzo is a secret that could very well shatter Konoha's beliefs. The people were sympathetic to Sasuke when his clan was killed. Not to mention, every ninja clan in Konoha would place their utter distrust on Konoha's administrative policies, creating a civil war in Konoha worse than Danzo's usurpation. Kakashi then went back to reading his book though, I suppose we can't confirm it yet. For all we know, Madara could only be lying to us to cause internal strife within Konoha while the rest of the alliance tries to fight off Akatsuki. Shikamaru didn't need to further his inquisition on the masked jonin. Naruto would be the one to open this topic to them in due time. He hoped that the rest of the people would feel the same way as well. Secluded Location Kisame merely tilted his head in amusement as he saw the giant raccoon jumping straight at him with claws outstretched. The shark man then swung his sword to the ground as his toothy smirk grew. Instantly, Kisame swung his blade sideward, 
parrying the gigantic blow of the bear holding Samahata with just his right hand. Kisame then deflected the blow with one mighty swing, recoiling Panta's claw back and Kisame gave a simple straight kick with his left leg straight at Panta's exposed abdomen. The thunderous attack made Panta stagger as he was sent flying away from Kisame and colliding to several dry tree barks. Kisame continued his toothy grin as he said with a smile, For a giant bear, you sure don't put up much of a fight. Kisame instantly leaned back and watched as pencil infused with lightning chakra whizzed by him in mere millimeters from his face before whizzing through a tree bark and embedding itself on a rock behind it. Those must be some vibrations if it can even have the piercing ability of a futon. I have to be careful of this one. Kisame looked to his side seeing Killer B had been the one to have thrown that pencil. Kisame simply smirked. Sabu immediately dislodged the wedge gigantic axe from the tree bark and jumped down. Holding the weapon on his shoulders, Sabu tapped his left foot forward and said, Panta is a raccoon. The Enkanin then lunged at Kisame and shouted, Taste my passion. Brandishing the giant axe, he swung it vertically overhead as Kisame held Samahata in one hand and blocked the deadly strike. To his left, he immediately saw Katana being hurled straight at him like the pencil did before as it whizzed through his compromised position. The Akatsuki member looked at his back and saw that Killer B was approaching at him fast. Kisame instantly knew he was cornered to a position that left him vulnerable from the eight tails. As Killer B swooped in to finish the job, sword coated with lightning chakra, Kisame slid Samahata down for a moment, exposing its head when the bandages tore off from the blade of Sabu's axe. The sword clashed with Samahata as the one that flew slid on another piece of bandage that covered the overbearing weapon. The white cloth fell down, and Killer B could see the monster of the hidden mist sword contorted and convulsed in front of him, as the intended effect of his sword vanished. Kisame kicked Sabu back, sending the Enka Nin flying and landing on Panta's stomach, as Kisame bore down on Killer B with his monstrous strength. Hashigaki Kisame, do remember my name, said the fish man, with a smirk that could intimidate even the most hardened shinobi. Samahata is getting very happy from the chakra it has been eating. Kisame said in amused chuckle Killer B replied, You, I'm gonna beat. With my fists, I'll knock your teeth. Bubbles of chakra began pouring from around Killer B, as the said area began to feel the chakra and malicious killing intent radiating from the eight-tailed host. We. Killer B could suddenly feel himself getting stronger, his strength boosting from the upgrade of the eight-tails chakra. Sabu who had recovered from the blow of the blue man's attack, looked hopeful when he saw the chakra shroud that surrounded the eight tails like a second rippling skin. His joy wouldn't last, however, as the sword from Kisame's hand suddenly spiked to new levels as it began tearing itself from the bandages, extending and contorting inside as the tailed beast's chakra was instantly absorbed by the grotesque-looking sword that now had its mouth at the tip of the blade gaping and reaching for Killer B. Kisame's ferocious grin grew again as he chuckled and shouldered his weapon to his shoulders. Now you've done it. You made Samahata thoroughly excited from your chakra. With a mighty swing, Kisame shouted, O-R-R-R-R-A-H-E-C-H, and slashed down the sword straight at Killer B who had instantly dodged the blow. The ground beneath the two shattered as fissures suddenly formed and rocks flew upwards from the force of impact. Killer B backed away from the site of destruction as the ground was leveled from Kisame's strength. Samahata then popped from the ground upwards, erecting itself from the ground as it dashed its way to Killer B. The ground beneath formed a straight fissure to Killer B looked around as four more of the said blades popped from the ground and surrounded him from all sides. Killer B's head turned around as the swords crashed their way towards him fast. The earth gave a thunderous explosion as dust and debris flew upwards from the force of the blow. Kisame popped his head from the ground and slowly rose from a fair distance, smirking as he hefted the blade to his shoulder. He had hit the Hachibi dead on from that last attack, and with the chakra cloak ineffective against him, the eight-tailed host's reliance on the Bija's chakra was practically pointless to someone like him. He was trained to wield Samahata, trained to fight and win against Jinchuriki and Biju. He knew how these people rely on chakra-based attacks and area-of-effect jutsu that can cause massive devastation. Due to their overwhelming sources of chakra, Jinchuriki were considered super-soldiers of any hidden village. Kisame was trained to fight that threat. Instead of withstanding the overwhelming force of their attacks, 
Kisame would absorb theirs and use the chakra absorbed by Samahada and attack. In essence, his former village had trained him to be the perfect counter, the anti-Junchuriki. As he viewed the smoke settling itself, Kisame was suddenly surprised as he saw a solitary black sphere the size of a man in the middle. Kisame kept his guard up. He had not experienced this kind of form from any Jinchuriki he had faced. If the dense chakra reverberating in the atmosphere was any indication, Kisame would duly note to brace himself from what was about to happen. Moments earlier. It was looking bleak, no matter what attack that he threw against the Akatsuki member. That ugly sword kept absorbing his chakra making his offensive strikes absolutely useless. Lariat with the chakra cloak was out of the question. If that sword can take a full force of the Eight Tails Chakra while using it, then Lariat would be utterly useless. Damn it, B. It looks like they sent someone more competent. He's the perfect counter to any of our attacks. What are we going to do? How about we go for version 2? Killer B grinned and said to the Bijas sealed inside him, If we want to beat this foo, I say we go for version 2. Hachibi gleefully nodded and said to his host, Version 2 it is then. With the impact about to come at him at that second, the brown biju chakra seeped out of Killer B and surrounded him once more like a shroud. However, this time, the shroud's tails began to surround Killer B like a cocoon. Present time The black sphere then began to vibrate slowly, shaking mildly before violently shattering like glass. Winds and gale forces had pushed Kisame back his sandals skidding to the ground as he grappled it with the use of Samahada. As the epicenter of the black sphere let out a powerful chakra blast four black tails sprouted from the middle shaking and swaying as the form of the man that was Killer B revealed itself from the dust now covered in black with the Bijou's potent chakra. The Bijou compressed into human form let out acrid smoke from its mouth as the dense chakra of the Bijou permeated in the air radiating with killing intent so much that even Sabu had to support himself on a tree bark as Killer B flexed his left arm. Bone began to coalesce on his shoulder coming together like permeable liquid and forming a skull of a horned bull. Killer B's left arm shook at the absolute intensity of the chakra being collected on his left arm forming the bull's skull. Lariat. Killer B then appeared in front of Kisame giving his vicious clothesline attack straight at Kisame's chest who parried with his sword, trying to absorb the immense chakra of the attack. The force of the attack forced Kisame back as he suddenly felt alarmed that Samahada was becoming sluggish all of a sudden. The chakra being absorbed from the eight-tailed host was too much. Samahada can't take it all at once. It was then that Samahada was parried away from Kisame and Killer B plowed through Kisame through his immense force, hitting Kisame straight in the chest, as his cloak was shredded to bits. His ribs, blood vessels, skin and muscle were crushed from the devastating blow. Kisame was flung back by the force of the blow from Killer B, smashing through rocks and trees sending him crashing onto a giant tree as blood fell from his chest. Kisame began to cough blood from his mouth. However, despite from the immense and excruciating pain he is currently experiencing, the monster of the hidden mist remained let out a smile and said, That was a good attack. You got me. Killer B somewhat sighed in relief as his chakra cloak died down. He looked at Kisame who was still smirking despite the fatal injury. Killer B was about to finish Kisame off, as he grabbed one of his swords and dashed at the man. It was then that Killer B had suddenly stopped as he saw Samahada suddenly surging from the ground and back to Kisame's hands. He 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 he, you didn't think it was over just like that, did you? Kisame asked. As Samahada's handle began to extend and slither its way to Kisame's hands, the chakra absorbed earlier began its process of regenerating Kisame's injuries, closing the wound carved on his chest as bones began to reform and regenerate. Tendons and muscles began attaching and realigning itself as a perfectly new skin had reformed and covered his body once again. Smoke had danced to where the injury had been, and Kisame gave a deep breath as he gave that toothy grin of his. I get stronger the stronger my opponent is. I never get tired and I can't be defeated. That why they call me the beast with no tail. Sabu had immediately deduced Kisame's ability. His sword. It's his most lethal weapon. Be if you can grab that sword, you can utterly stop him. Kisame then clapped his hands together. He cheeks puffed up as his neck stretched Sabu could actually feel the amount of chakra that Kisame was molding from the fish man's mouth. In one hurling motion, Water gushed like a raging tsunami as Kisame shouted menacingly. 
Sway Tun, Daibakuswashuha. Water release, great exploding water colliding wave. The raging tsunami reached a height of 50 feet as it gushed through the forest like a broken dam, taking Killer B, Sabu and Ponto with the surge of waves. Amidst the raging waters that unceremoniously put a large part of the forest underwater, Kisame stood with Samahat emerging. Scales began to define more as his head and back grew a fin and on the apex of his buttocks grew a tail. The interlaces of his fingers and feet grew webbed, as three sets of gills grew from each side of his neck. Kisame's appearance grew much more predatory as his smile grew. Grab my sword, you say? I'd let you do that. Kisame menacingly floated above Sabu and Killer B as he continued, if you can separate it from my body that is. Kisame leaned forward as his unrivaled speed underwater kicked in and swam towards Killer B. The eight-tailed host soon changed back to his compressed beast form made a quick dash towards Sabu and Panta, swimming through the dome of the water while grabbing both the Enkanin and his pet. You can't escape. You're too much in a disadvantage. Kisame began picking up speed as he began swerving towards Killer B. Damn it, B. He's faster underwater. We can't run forever. We'll die faster this way. It was then that the eight-tailed host reached for the edge of the underwater prison and swerved to his left swimming as fast as he could. Killer B suddenly saw Kisame, instead of going after him, went after Sabu and Panta. Inwardly, the eight-tailed host cursed and swam back as Kisame's fins on his forearms revealed needles about to stab the two. Killer B had suddenly cut in front, but not before Kisame turning to the eight-tailed host, giving him one of his infamously devious and playfully dangerous smiles as the black chakra cloak receded revealing Killer B underneath. You fell for it, said Kisame as he swam towards Killer B and bumped the man with the side of his fin. It was then that four cephalopod tentacles had emerged from the tails that Killer B had, and began strangling Kisame far away from Sabu and Panta as possible. As soon as the two were safe, the cephalopods again receded back into the transparent chakra cloak as Kisame chuckled, just merely touching me would result in your chakra being drained. I hope you aren't having trouble breathing. It would be so bothersome to explain to my boss why you suffocated from my Swiro same Odori no Jutsu, water prison shark dance. Of course, I tend to make some mistakes along the way. Killer B began pushing bubbles out of his lungs finding it harder and harder to breathe now that his chakra levels were getting weaker. He could still perform a full transformation. He just needed to make sure he got away from this man as soon as possible. Gathering chakra in his mouth, Killer B had let his cheeks puff out and leaned his body slightly back as he began spewing ink around Kisame's area. The whole water dome had suddenly been enveloped in black smog, spreading through the gigantic blob of water. Once Killer B had spread the ink, he then swam as far as he could. But it would not be as Kisame, when merged with Samahada, has an ability to detect the chakras around him, he could feel how close or how far they are, and as B was about to reach the edge of the dome, Kisame had swerved towards the eight-tailed host and instantly grappled him. Outside The clear blue water of the dome had suddenly turned pitch black from the ink spray, the water had then, like a bubble, had burst and popped. Kisame's form then receded back as Samahata began to take its sword form once again. At the sudden turn of events, Killer B had jumped back and his chakra cloak was activated once more. This time, the eight-tailed host expanded the chakra within him as shouted, Man was I filled with dread, I thought I was dead. The chakra then expanded in size, as the tails began turning to cephalopods again. With the chakra expanding and solidifying once it reached its peak height, Killer B continued as the form of the eight tails had appeared in all its glory. Fish face, let me tell you about MY situation. Red and blue globules of chakra then popped up from the right-tailed beast. As it began collecting it at its mouth, the chakra became condensed to a point it appeared as black as the sphere it had earlier, the ball then compressed. The energy grew volatile as the surge of chakras grew more and more violent as each second passed. It was then that the eight tails bit the small orb of chakra and then aimed it at Kisame. I'm the undisputed king of destruction. Kisame was instantly on it. From what he could feel from that attack, it would certainly be devastating enough to tear him apart down to the last cell. He held out Samahada upwards and jumped aiming for the beast's head. The eight-tailed ox turned its head upwards as the energy for its own Imari, menacing ball, 
reached into maximum levels. As the charge up ended, the gigantic beast leaned back a little and braced its forearms on the ground, and fired the blast from its mouth. Boom! A resounding explosion was heard all around the forest as the force of the recall sent winds surpassing 100 km per hour streaming around the eight-tailed beast, blowing anything around it. The ground beneath the beast gave in from the impact, shattering and embedding the beast below. The stream of red light streaked through the winter-laden sky upwards forcing a portion of the thick clouds to give way as the blast opened a hole in the cloud-ridden sky. Did we get him? Killer B asked as the beast's head looked around. Did what get who? The voice had suddenly interrupted. Kisame had instantly appeared on top of one of the giant bull's horns with Samahada now larger than Kisame himself placed firmly on the fish man's shoulders. That was a pretty nasty attack just now, if it wasn't for the fact that I anticipated such an obvious attack, I doubt I'd be standing here down to the last cell. Kisame chuckled as he hefted Samahada above his head. You lose eight tails. Kisame shouted swinging Samahada down on the eight tail's head. Chakra began to be absorbed by the blade as Kisame slashed down. The eight tail box howled in as its chakra was siphoned away, crashing down on the ground the crater below caved in lower, as the eight-tailed beast receded back to its host. Kisame smiled as he raised his sword again and said as he was about to swipe down the blade, it would be such a pain if you could move. It's better to cut off your leg and so that you can't escape. Just as he was about to slash down on Killer B's leg, a sudden shuriken had been flung from behind him. Kisame leaned his head to the left and turned around in surprise, and found three Kumo Nin who had suddenly appeared in the area. You're too late! Kisame yelled as he motioned for Samahada to take off B's legs. Just as the blade was about to make contact on the ground, Samahada grappled itself on the ground hindering any further progress to finish what he had started. Samahada doesn't want to hurt the target. Kisame clicked his tongue in annoyance at the sudden turn of events. In aggravation to his predicament, Kisame punted Samahada by the hilt as it refused to obey his actions. The heavy sword fell to the side as suddenly jumped back when myriads of light energy began raining down his area. Rantan, Ryza Sakasu. Storm release, laser circus. Darui shouted, the projectiles of light streams blasting around Kisame and trailing him like bloodthirsty hounds. Kisame ducked in perfect timing as a ray of light went past him and exploded forcing Kisame to step away from the area that Killer B had laid. Kisame saw Samahada had found its way to the side of the eight-tailed host as the its handle wriggled and slithered its way to Killer B and began replenishing him with the chakra he had absorbed earlier. He somewhat feared that this would happen with his sword. The former Mizukage had warned him of Samahada's overindulgence. It could betray him at any given moment if he kept absorbing chakra from a single source. It so happened that the Eight Tails had a lot of chakra and used a lot of it in his attacks. He paid no heed however, as from past experiences with the blade had concluded it to him that Samahada's hunger for chakra seemed insatiable. Now, it seemed that even Samahada had a limit to how much it can absorb. The Eight-Tailed Host stood up slowly as he felt his chuckers replenished. Now that your ugly sword is through, get ready for round two. Killer B stood erect now as the chakra that he had lost earlier had returned back to him. He stretched his arms and flexed it as he smirked. His brother then shouted. B. I go high, you go low. Gothka bro. Was his immediate reply. Kisame clasped his hands together to form a water jutsu sequencing fast as the two approaching ninja had surrounded themselves in their respective auras. Sweitun, Gakuden no jutsu. Water release, great shark bullet. Kisame then leaned back once again, as liquid began collecting in his mouth and spat out fluid smashing on the ground, creating another tidal wave within the dense wood area. The water surged violently as it took form of a gigantic shark flailing in the air about the same size as the giant raccoon, Panta. It then sent itself diving towards the brothers who had jumped earlier and landed on top of the water. The rakage and killer be watched as the imposing water shark dived towards them at great speeds, splashing and exploding upon contact, sending particles of water splashing everywhere on the ground. Kisame smirked as he saw the rakage stand before him. He looked around everywhere his neck could bend normally. The rakage had charged at him with the man's right arm extended, 
It was then that the sudden chakra spike had Kisame noticed his back. Killer B with his right arm extended for a clothesline straight to the back of his neck. Double lariat! Both brothers yelled, as Kisame had suddenly extended his arms and blocked the blitz attacks coming from the lightning brothers with his hands. Lightning and Bija Cloak began to eat at Kisame's skin as his bones could actually feel his bones crack and shatter from the strength that both brothers delivered. Kisame chuckled, T that's was good. Kisame could feel the pain course through his hands as he was forcing it to push the attack away from his person. Both brothers stood agape at the strength that Kisame displayed, but strengthened their pushing force further. Kisame chuckled, so this is it, eh? Kisame shouted as he laughed when his arms finally gave out. With a last cry, Kisame shouted directly above, that was a great match. Both arms had instantly reached Kisame by the side of the chest and neck. Killer B hitting the chest as it plowed through the skin, tearing it open and along with fat and muscle as it shattered the bones in Kisame's ribs to shards and embedding itself in the lungs and heart. The rakage attack, once it connected to the neck, snapped the spinal cord there like a twig, severing it from the row of bones and disconnecting the nerves inside from the sudden rattling of bones as blood gushed from the opposite side severing the carotid artery and jugular vein spewing the life-giving liquid like a blocked hose nozzle. As the blue-skinned man's corpse fell down in a heap on the ground, both brothers gave a sigh of relief. The rakage then approached his brother with a tick on his shoulder. You got a lot of explaining to do, B. B could only feel the enthusiasm fade after that victory, as the shadow of his brother approached before him menacingly. Somehow, Killer B thought that he knew he forgot something. Kanoha. It had taken two excruciatingly long days, for Sakura at least, to reach Kanoha and separate for the Kiri representatives to make a beeline to the southeastern shore that led to water country. The travel itself was nothing special to say the least. Although, during the trip there was even an instance where Hinata and the Mizukage actually glared at each other to show their deep discontent with each other. Of course, Naruto, who had tried to defuse the situation and being the said person who was the source of their growing animosity, ended up worsening the situation. Oh, Hokage Dano, please make sure to tame some of your subordinates when you do get back to your village, they tend to go out of line in the chain of command said the Mizukage as she grabbed Naruto's right arm with hers and placed it firmly in her bosom. Sakura was the one who replied, We are not going out of my bounds, Mizukage-sama, but please show that you are a dignified leader of your village. We are just worried for our leader, please refrain displaying such. Sakura fought off the urge to mention any word that would result in an appropriate fight with the Mizukage. The woman would definitely kick her ass for it, not to mention that it could cause an international incident. Axe. Hokage Dano, now do you see? No respect for your position, said the Mizukage pointing her index finger to the pinkette. Naruto looked flustered when he felt those mounds mashing his arm. He laughed nervously, um. Mizukage Dano, they're just concerned about my well-being so. Mei-chan. What? Naruto asked immediately, utterly confused. Call me Mei-chan, Hokage Dano. After that little fiasco, it became more and more awkward for Naruto to interact with the people from Kiri, sure they were great to be around, but with his female subordinates showing those hawk-like gazes over him, he was on edge. It was somewhat a relief that they had to separate in order to get to Kiri once they made into a fork in the road and had to separate. Once they had seen the gates of Kanoha, they were greeted with the sight of a well-endowed blonde woman crossing her arms and looking as if she'd had a bad drinking spree last night. Brat. You've got a lot of explaining to do. To which the other blonde hastily replied, Who you calling a brat, you old bat? Shouldn't you be taking your afternoon nap? Tsunade snapped, Old bat. That's it, you little mongrel. When I'm through with you, your mouth won't be the only thing closed shut. Oh yeah. Why don't you just SDIC to knitting then? You wouldn't want to strain your back from overworking. You're dead. Tsunade shouted gripping her fists as Naruto paled, when he remembered what Tsunade could do with single finger flick, he was about to run when the elder woman tackled him down, placed his head in a lock and began ruffling it with her hands. You little rascal, I knew you had it in you to show that decrepit old crone who's boss around here, she said with a smile still ruffling her successor's head. 
Naruto only grinned at that as he spoke. Good to see that you're awake, Bachan. Tsunade grinned at that herself and said, Ha! Huh? Am I ever glad that you're back, Naruto? Now let's get to your office while we talk. You're going to have to tell me what happened during the summit, and how you subdued that old fart. Naruto then dismissed his group telling them of a well-deserved rest. Once they had made it back, Naruto sat on the seat at the back of the desk and placed his elbows on the table with his hands covering his face. I see, so that's why Sasuke is coming after the advisors. Tsunade placed a hand on her chin as she herself began to think. I can't just let this slide, Bachan. They managed to usurp control from old man Sande more than once, and I'm sure that they could have done so during your time as well. All that it needed was for Danzo to authorize it and let him handle the problem himself. Now with Root exterminated, I can honestly say that we have them cornered. Naruto looked serious at that. Gigi told me once that the government exists for the people. Although Itachi was blamed for the incident, there were still many people that could have responded the night of the massacre. The patrolling A and B were replaced with either Danzo's men or were given orders to stay away from the scene of the crime, and the old man was given no choice. I can't trust them, Bachan. I can't trust the advisors without going behind my back. I need to replace them. Although what they did could be understandable, the Sandame could have developed terms and compromises with the Uchiha clan. We didn't give them a chance, Bachan. They already knew what was going to happen further ahead yet they didn't do anything. There were no negotiations that could have been done. But even the old man and with his peace talks, most of the proposals that they sent were denied. Even if the Hokage was the one who authorized those proposals, they would utterly be rejected or be destroyed by one of the three. Simply put, they wanted to keep the Uchiha in line. So you're doing this. Tsunade mentioned and Naruto had cut her off. I'm doing this in order to prevent another massacre. Who's to say that they would stop with the Uchiha? There are still prominent clans here that are infamous throughout the village, mostly the Hyuga. They have the power and influence. They also have money. And although the clan has been given reigns and ministrations on its own, they could fear for the day that at least one of these clans would eventually turn out the same as the Uchiha. I knew that independent clan act bullshit was asking for trouble. Tsunade mentioned. That law was created during the rule of the Nidame. It came along with the establishment of the police force. It was meant to give every prominent ninja clan in Kanoha privacy in matters involving their clan, in the process. It gave each clan to talk about their problems amongst themselves. And with great independence, settle problems quickly without the needed approval of the Hokage. And if Tsunade could recall... The establishment of the law, along with the police force happened on the very last few days that the Nidame had implemented. It meant that the succession of the advisors took place those few days. It only leads to one thing that Tsunade had her inkling suspicion on. Those two never did trust the other ninja clans like Danzo did. The Independent Clan Act was just there to isolate the remaining clans from the politics of the village itself. As long as these clans don't try to meddle with the politics enlisted in the village, they were safe. The Uchiha, who have almost one-third of the forces during that time, tried that and the establishment of the police force was given to them. It kept them busy thinking it could place them into a power that's comparable to the Senju. Tsunade then continued, If I know Saratobi sensei he'd have kept notes of his most memorable decision-making policies when he became Hokage along with a lot of prominent events, we need gather them and study it here. If those notes are still present we can have enough incriminating evidence to convict Hamira and Koharu. With that, Tsunade had stood up and opened the door about to leave the office. But before she did, she smirked and said to the blonde, Good luck with the paperwork, brat. I'm glad I'm finally out of that hell hole. She then laughed as she closed the door when Naruto groaned and said to the Godame, Don't remind me, Bachan. When Tsunade left, Naruto sighed as he slumped in his chair when he turned around to view his village. Without as much as a hitch, he had raised his right hand slightly and an ANBU member had jumped down, wearing a bird mask. The masked operative had then kneeled down in front of his leader as Naruto spoke. Torai guard Tsunade with your team. Root may be gone, but I don't want to take chances. There could still be remnants of Danzo's forces that are in contact with the two advisors, I want you guard Tsunade while she searches for old man Hokage's notes. While you're at it, tell Sai to come to the tower when he can. 
I need an assignment to be done with his help. Torai nodded and vanished from sight. Naruto stood up from his seat and walked out of the office. He needed to train in his fuinjutsu again. It seemed a lot of work, but if he could start on his free time, the more advantage they would have on this war. He needed to speak with some of the minor leaders about what had taken place. The more allies he has, the more chances that they could win this war, and the first place he had thought of was the land of his fellow student under Jiraiya. Amigeku no Sado. Unknown Location The first thing that Sasuke could feel when he woke up was a terrible ache. He felt sore all over as he sat up carefully. When he opened his eyes, he found himself in a strange place where the ground were completely symmetrical. Squares, rectangles, quadrilaterals littered the area around him below a dark and blue painted sky. A spiral contortion of the space in front of him, and Karen revealed Madara who stood in front of him as he said, Well, Sasuke, even though it was a tough job, good work. We've rattled them up pretty well. And good job in obtaining Susano. Sasuke squint his eyes for a moment. The blurring vision of his eyes was occurring. His eyesight was getting worse. When he had faced off against the five Kages, he never delivered a clean blow to any of them. They were in a different league on their own. But when the five of them are in the same field, it was like climbing a mountain you can't overcome. The fact that the realization had dawned on him that he had faced the five Kages made him almost too weak at the knees at his own foolishness. What had drove him like that? What kind of madness did he place himself into? He had damaged his eyes severely for nothing. How was he supposed to extract his revenge on the elders now? How will he be able to deal the justice that he had craved for his family? For Itachi? Would it just end this way? He going blind before he could kill them? No. He won't let it happen. He won't allow it. He won't let it end this way. The truth that Itachi had seen, if it meant serving out that hammer of justice, then he would do it. He would force himself to see Itachi's viewpoint. Through Itachi's eyes. Madara, give me Itachi's eyes. I want to place his eyes in mine. Madara merely gave a smile underneath his spiraling orange mask. Sasuke was getting closer and closer to his ideal pawn. Although it would set back his plans for a good six months with Sasuke getting used to the new vision and the retraining of his Manjiku techniques, all of it would be worth it in the end. His plans would surely succeed. Six months was plenty of time. It would do no good to rush things.